We will never know how many friends and family didn't get COVID-19 because we followed safeguards. We'll never know that number. We'll never know how many lives we save because we wear masks, wash our hands, and keep our distance. We'll never know exactly who we help when we take protective steps each day. We'll only know that we did all we could to save people from a dangerous pandemic. And that's a nice thing for us to live with. Together, we are beating COVID-19. Hi, everyone. Welcome back for day two of Telling Your Health Story. I'm Charlotte Sutton, Assistant Managing Editor for Health and Business at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I hope you're learning as much as I am from our tremendous speakers. A quick recap for those of you who are joining us for the first time today. We created Telling Your Health Story last year to help encourage and grow the amazing community of physicians, nurses, students, policy advocates, caregivers, and others who write great stories for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Their perspectives and their writing are unique because they can go where journalists like me can't go. With the coronavirus pandemic hitting higher numbers every day, it is more essential than ever to make sure that people understand how serious this illness is. And today, we'll be hearing from two writers who survived serious cases of COVID-19 and from a nurse practitioner in New York who was among the first brave medical professionals to go public to show just how dire the situation was becoming last spring and how badly her hospital and her colleagues and her patients needed personal protective equipment, staffing beds, just everything. The pandemic plus months of justified public outrage over police shootings and racial injustice have also brought new and badly needed attention to a very long to the very long standing scourges in our society systemic racism poverty stigma and inequality these are tough issues to discuss but again you have the kinds of access and experience to tell these incredibly important stories and our speakers today, I think, will help inspire you to do that important work. A few housekeeping items. This entire conference is being recorded and you all will have access to both days of the sessions. You'll receive emails next week with the details you need to get into those recordings. So don't knock yourself out taking notes. Instead, I think that you'll get a whole lot more out of our sessions if you focus on the writing experiment or the writing exercises, I should say. And also think about whether you would like to tell your health story here at our conference. We're doing our first ever story slam this afternoon and you have until noon to sign up. We'll give you just three to four minutes. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a frightening ordeal at all. Uh, to get up and 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 share some aspect of your experience in your life that that uh, you would like all of us to hear. Um, Neil Barden from First Person Arts, who was one of our speakers yesterday, will be back to host. And um, I have seen him in action, and he is excellent at so soothing the nerves of storytellers. So you're in good hands there. Finally, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Independence Blue Cross and our co-sponsor, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Their generosity has made this event possible, and it also is helping to support the health journalism that we do every day at the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'd also like to recognize the folks who are joining us this weekend from inspire.com, which is a community of literally millions of people who find hope and healing in condition specific groups of peers who know exactly what they're going through. Inspire has sent some extraordinary writers to the Inquirer over the years, and I know that they'll continue to do so. I would like to thank the leadership at the Inquirer for giving us the support to make this program possible, especially our publisher and CEO, Lisa Hughes, and our top editor, Gabriel Escobar. 
And finally, a very big thank you to the Lenfest Institute for Journalism, which is the nonprofit that owns the Inquirer. And they do the important work that truly enables us to keep public interest at the core of our mission every day. So thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker today. Dr. Irene Mathieu is a general pediatrician at the University of Virginia, where she serves as director of the Pediatric Department's Equity and Inclusion Committee. And she's also a member of the affiliate faculty in the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics. She's the author of three poetry collections. And she is a graduate of the College of William and Mary and Vanderbilt University, where she got her medical degree. She completed her residency in general pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she has received a number of prestigious fellowships, including from the Fulbright Foundation. Dr. Mathieu's creative and advocacy work has been featured in scores of media outlets, including The Inquirer, NPR, The Washington Post, The LA Times, and very recently, on Doctors Who Create, which if you don't know about it, please Google it. This is a wonderful uh, website that was created by uh, Vidya Viswanathan, another pediatrician, and she was among our speakers yesterday. I highly, re I highly recommend an article that Iren wrote for Doctors who, who Create early this year about why doctors write. I think that her words apply to anyone who's in a high stress situation which these days really feels like everyone, doesn't it? I'll just give you a little sample and then we'll bring on Iren. Self-care as a reason for writing. This should probably be first, but write only if it makes you feel whole and happy. Medical training is rough. There's no need to add more to your plate unless it does something essential for your health and well-being. Writing does that for me. Without it, I actually don't feel like myself. That being said, of course, there were months, like in the PICU and NICU, when I was barely able to eat and sleep enough, let alone pick up a pen or crack open my laptop. Prioritizing my health was how I got through those rotations. But I always come back to writing because it feeds me. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Irene Mathieu. Hi, good morning. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you, Charlotte, for that introduction. And thank you and the entire team at the Inquirer for putting on this conference and inviting me to be a part of it. It's really exciting to be here today. Thanks so much, Erin. So I'd like to walk you all today through a brief discussion of narrative medicine. And then we'll talk specifically about poetry as a tool within narrative medicine. But I want to spend the bulk of my presentation today really walking you all through some poetry exercises so that you have a chance to try your hand at this. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So first I'll start with some disclosures and I'll just read this uh, slide to you. Irene Mathieu is a granddaughter of Creole New Orleans and the daughter of Catherine and Michael Mathieu. Her ancestors include native peoples, likely from the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and other tribes. West Africans, likely from what are now Senegal and the Gambia. Spanish, French, and Dutch immigrants and colonizers and others. Like many people, her family history is complicated. And as a fifth generation college student, she has inherited significant privilege. At the same time, she is the descendant of peoples who were enslaved and had their land taken from them. Born in the late 1980s to physician parents in one of the wealthiest countries on earth, Irene works to better understand her life and actions in the larger context of these histories, both through creative writing and through doctoring in the tradition of Western biomedicine. She practices this work on unceded land belonging to the Monacan people. I read this to you because I wanted to give you what I call an alternative bio. You heard the bio that Charlotte so graciously read, which was full of many proper nouns that are were typically the names of institutions or prizes. And this bio, as you'll notice, is full of proper nouns that refer to people and places. And I think this is important because it demonstrates the power of words and how what we say or what we leave out really shapes the context of our understanding. 
The bio that Charlotte read, like many speaker bios, is really meant to impress, right? It's meant to get you excited to hear from me, who for most of you, I'm probably a complete stranger. So why should you listen to me? But the bio I just read is to provide more context for my life in the larger histories of which I'm a part, and also to acknowledge that I understand um, where I am situated in history physically and in time. And so that's just a little exercise to sort of demonstrate the power of words. Next slide, please. So Maya Angelou said that words are things, and she meant that they are physical things. And I'd like to posit to you that they are things in the, in the way that they actually have material impacts on the world. So words, and specifically our languages and our thoughts, shape our actions and behaviors. And those actions and behaviors very directly shape the world around us and have long-term material impacts. So if we can intervene in our minds at the level of where languages, language become thoughts and thoughts become actions, then we can actually change our actions and behaviors and therefore change our outcomes. And stories work as qualitative data. So they really illustrate emotional experiences and they convey empathy and compassion and convey experiences in ways that quantitative data cannot. So I think that stories are fundamental, not only to how we communicate with one another, but also to how we talk about health, um, particularly when it comes to our trainees, um, those who are training to become healthcare providers. Next slide, please. So some of you all may already be familiar with narrative medicine, and I know you all been talking about it to some extent this weekend. But just to give you the official definition from Rita Sharon, who's considered widely to be the mother of narrative medicine, she called it um, the close reading and reflective writing that builds narrative competence, which is the ability to acknowledge, absorb, interpret, and act on the stories and plights of others. And that impacts four relational areas. And this is a little physician centered, um, but you could apply this to many different types of healthcare providers. So provider to self, provider's relationship to the patient, our relationship to our colleagues and our relationship to our larger society. And the way that we sort of think about our story and with respect to other people and vice versa really impacts our interactions with those people. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna briefly run through the evidence for narrative medicine. Does it really work? And we know that when we look at um, reading literary fiction, which the authors in this study defined as fiction that had won a major award or sort of is cons widely considered to be a classic, it improved performance on a theory of mind task, which is basically a psychological task that measures empathy. And another study found that medical students' exposure to the humanities signific significantly correlated with a host of positive attributes that we really um, I think all would like to have in our physicians, which include empathy, tolerance for ambiguity, wisdom, emotional appraisal, self-efficacy and spatial skills, and inversely correlated with some burnout symptoms. So it was protective uh, against burnout. Next slide, please. Another quasi-experimental narrative medicine program with pre-health students in Taiwan showed significant results in the intervention group that received the narrative medicine intervention and it showed that this group had increases in their reflective skepticism, empathetic reflection, critical open-mindedness, their perceptions of patient-provider communication, as well as empathy. Another experimental program with medical students in Iran showed improvements in reflection and empathy. And there have been several reviews of narrative medicine programs that show how they improve doctor-patient communication, personal growth, and they're also widely enjoyed and well-received by participants. Another review of narrative medicine programs found that 88% um, rated it very positively. And then a qualitative evaluation within that review showed multiple competencies where um, students and trainees showed improvement. So again, things like empathy, relationship building, perspective taking, um, decreasing burnout and improving resilience, as well as a sense of confidence and pers personal accomplishment, narrative competence and ethical, ethical inquiry. And then when we look at patient experiences, similarly, there is literature to suggest that when we engage patients in writing their own stories, there are positive outcomes. So elderly patients with hip fractures who were enrolled in a narrative medicine program reported increased perceived self-efficacy and decreased depression um, after their recovery process. And there are several studies that have been done in patients with cancer. One showed that those whose stories um, included more emotional disclosure, who wrote more kind of personal and deeply emotional stories, had a lower pain scale rating and a higher well-being rating at the end of that program. 
An additional study with 86 participants showed increased peace and well being and lower depressed mood, and that was among women with cancer. Next slide, please. And then finally, there was a study looking at patients who had both HIV and PTSD. And expressive writing sessions with these patients resulted, resulted in decreased PTSD, depression, and physical symptoms for women living with HIV. So we're talking generally about narrative medicine, which includes many types of literature, but I wanna focus now specifically on poems. And so why am I focusing on poems? Besides the obvious bias that I have as a poet, um, I think that poems are uniquely situated as a tool for us within narrative medicine because they are very weird. Poems are strange. They are, they are generally not written the way that we write other types of stories and nonfiction. And so I'd like to um, draw your attention to this quote from Kumagai and Ware, um, who said that poems and the arts kind of make strange. So they talk about using the arts to disrupt the automaticity of thinking in order to discover new ways of perceiving and being in the world. And I would argue that poems do that particularly well because they are so bizarre and so different from how we normally speak. Poems have many doors. So by that, I mean, there are many ways in and out. They don't necessarily have to start at the beginning and end at the ending. And we'll see some examples of this soon. They're also vulnerable. Um, Often poems really go to those deep emotional places and talk about things that can be very difficult to talk about um, directly in, in first person prose. They shift power because um, they, they sort of render us as the reader a little bit powerless because we are suddenly at the behest of the author and, or the speaker who may be speaking in a way that's very defamiliarizing. And so that makes us feel vulnerable as well, which can I think be a really good exercise and their dynamic. So the meaning of a poem can change over time. It can mean a different thing to you today than it means when you read the same poem in 10 years. I've written poems that other people have interpreted in ways that I didn't even imagine. So they really are kind of living creatures and that change over time. And they generally are shorter. So I call them multi-sensory micro stories. So they often have some sort of story component but they're told in a different way as with a slant, as Emily Dickinson said, she said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. But they usually are shorter, which I think make them a little bit more convenient um, sometimes for busy healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. And I, I now want to undo any trauma any of you may be carrying from 11th grade English class, um, where we are often forced to kind of sit there and find the meaning of the poem as if that's sort of the main point of the poem. And I'd like to break that down for you and offer to you that there that is not the only way to look at a poem and that a poem is really an experience and you can have whatever kind of experience you want with that poem. There isn't a right way to experience a poem, but there are only two rules. The first rule is that the I in the poem, so when a poem says, I did this, I did that, we never assume that the I is the poet. We call this person the speaker, um, just like in fiction, we would call it you know, the narrator or the main character. And the second rule is that anything is possible. So I've put a comic strip here where um, this woman says, I wrote a poem today. The man says, really? And she says, I don't know if it's any good, but it felt good to do something creative for a change. And he says, let's see. And she says, you know, they say, write what you know. And he reads the title of the poem, which is Diaper Funk. So if there are any pediatricians or people that have small children, this may be familiar, but I mean it very seriously. You can literally write about anything you want. Next slide, please. So now we'll read some poems, or rather we'll hear some poems read by the authors. Um, this poem does have some references to um, violence and it also has one curse word, so I apologize, um, but we will now play the audio clips. Boy in the Belt. The belt is an extension of dad and dad is an extension of God. The boy is an extension of dad too. The belt is just one thread tying them together. The boy prays the belt stays wrapped around dad's waist. The belt does not believe in God, but if the belt did believe in anything, the belt would call it purpose. The belt began as skin on the cow. Its purpose was to protect and it failed. The boy knows all about that. The boy has purpose too. Dad and God and mostly he fails. The belt's new purpose is to hold, to contain dad's expanding waist. Except when the boy fights, 
Then the belt is born again as a classroom ruler with the day's lesson. Maybe the belt and the boy can rebel. The boy tugs at the thread that will bring dad and the belt. The boy won't lie about his bruised brother or call it anything noble. The boy fights because he is bigger. Dad says he has no choice. The belt says it has no choice. The boy understands he displeases God. When the belt meets the boy, the belt kisses the boy and leaves purple lipstick. Dad understands this as an act of love. The belt doesn't know about love. The belt knows it completed its job. And the boy hears love. The title of this poem is Poem to Take the Belt Out of My Dad's Hands. In this story, he is wearing the belt instead of bringing it down. My ass stays soft. My head stays hard. In this story, the belt hangs in his closet. I snatch it and bury it. In this story, the belt acts alone. It is not his hands. He is watching TV, Sports Center, or whatever. He would stop the belt if he could. In this story, I grab the belt and beat myself with it. In this story, it is my own hands. His hands stay innocent. I stand above myself and it is for my own good. In this story, I bury the leather belt in a cement coffin. I eat a whole cow and wear the skin like a luxurious silk. In this story, I am waiting for the whip. In this story, I am already crying. In this story, he doesn't reach for the belt. The belt is buried. He reaches for my head and rubs it soft. He says it's okay. In this story, there is no but. This story ends here. My dad, me, still under his hands, still crying. So those were two poems by Jose Olivares. And I want you first to think about what draws you in about these, these two poems. Is there a line or a phrase or an image that really kind of strikes you and makes you sit up and pay attention. And this is something that, this is often a way that I start thinking about a poem. You know, what is that thing that really sort of grabs my attention and why? Why is it that that image or that line is so powerful to me? So just think about that for a moment. And I'd also like you to think about the way that Olivares uses time in these poems. You know, they're two separate poems, but they were published together. So they obviously are meant to be read one after another. And so I'd like you to think about where we are in time. We kind of move between the past and the present, and then sort of this imagined parallel universe in a way. And I want you to think about why the poet chose to, um, to write these poems in juxtaposition like this. And feel free to leave some comments now in the comment area, and I will read some of them aloud. I just want to know what your impressions are of this poem and why you think um, Jose Olivares made the choices that he did in the way that he told this story. One person is really impressed by the lipstick image. And the way that he transformed the role of the cowhide. So really that transformation um, does anyone else have, have thoughts about the role of transforming one thing into another in this poem and, and how that kind of functions through different times?
Right. So someone says like love and God um, constantly transforming in these poems. So, right. That, that interesting juxtaposition of relationship between love and God, and then where the father in this poem sort of sits kind of between both of them. And, and as the speaker is trying to work out what these concepts mean, somebody says that he personalizes the belt. It's not an inanimate object anymore. Right. And I think um, someone else says the belt is a character, which is a really interesting. I don't know if you all have thoughts about why the poet chose to do that in this poem. Someone says the poems come together to become even more powerful because that allows us to understand both perspectives. Both our love and through the lens of love, we understand a difficult subject. Yeah, that's a great po point. I think the poet is really trying to offer multiple perspectives on something that um, that is really tough to talk about. In the first poem, he accepts the belt, someone says. In the second poem, he resists, right? And, and that personification of the belt almost sort of takes um, the agency from the dad to the belt. So somebody says the belt in a weird way is almost a friend to the speaker. It's something that can empathize with him, even though his father cannot. And um, someone else says, you know, as, as somebody who has never experienced what's in this poem and finds it unimaginable, the writer's love-hate relationship with it is, is fascinating. Um, and someone else really resonates with this poem from their childhood. And um, this person points out that the poetry really creates images and this longing for the dad to, to love him gently and to teach him in less painful ways. Right, and so some, someone says the belt as its own character removes judgment, which I think is really um, a critical key. It sort of takes that agency or that power from the hands of the dad and sort of places it in the belt and, and says almost, well, this is not dad's fault. This is the belt doing this thing, which is sort of a way for the speaker to kind of work through something traumatic um, in a way that still allows him to have a relationship with his father and to love his father. So it's, I think it's a really powerful poem because it, it illustrates how we can use language and stories, including alternative endings to stories as a way to reconceptualize experiences um, that sort of give back that agency um, to somebody who may have been bereft of agency, such as a young child experiencing what the speaker experienced. Um, someone else says that the pace uh, made their heart race and that he really wanted to kind of share that experience or that feeling, absolutely. So I'd like to move to the next slide. And what I want you to think about um, is our first writing prompt. So I'm gonna give you about two minutes. I, I know that you're not gonna be able to write a completed poem in two minutes. The purpose of these writing prompts is really to allow you to just start thinking about something. And then later this weekend or another day, you might pull out this sheet of paper again and say, you know, now that I have time and I've processed this a bit, I'll take these first few lines and really expand it. So for this writing prompt, I want you to think about a time that you or somebody else you were close to felt powerless and write about how that situation ended. And then I want you to write an alternative ending. How does the power dynamic shift in the poem when you change your alternative ending? I mean, when you write your alternative ending and you don't have to um, write an actual poem. If you feel more comfortable just writing this out as a story at first, feel free to do that. Just jot down some notes and it may be something that could become a poem later. So I'll give you about two minutes to write down some things around that and just take notes for yourself. And if you'd like to try writing a poem too, please feel free.
Okay. So wrap up your final thoughts and feel free to come back to this at another time. So we'll now move on to the next poem. Notes on the State of Virginia 2. February, I am an open wound, woman discarded and woman emerging, scars devising scars. To live here, we know precisely how to be haunted. Sundown sun, a sterile sky come running, Sweet gallow grass whistling ghosts. All year we learn that chainsaw hymnal. Outside the lawn, another excavation. Slave quarters found concealed in the student dorms. Buried rooms choked, sounds bricked off. Two centuries thorns may break sudden bloom. What can we say? No one speaks of it. I dream pristine. And skirting the caution tape instead, we clasp hands with each other in complicity. Somewhere, the ghost arm of history still throttling me. Taste of old blood on the wind. The crouched statue of Sacagawea shrouded behind the pioneers. Creature of unbelonging, unname this new silence. Magnolia explosion, its leviathan shade. Then fall, what sick messiah. Fall, I am coughing in the aisles again. Where bare triage of voices pour molasses in my ear. Where a bald insurrection of tongues, then squashed rebellion, scrutiny, indoctrination. To live here, we know precisely how to be hunted. So that was Notes on the State of Virginia 2 by Sophia Sinclair. And I'm just going to give a little bit of background about this poem for anyone who may be a little confused. So Notes on the State of Virginia um, originally was the title of a series of works written by Thomas Jefferson, sort of about Virginia and particularly Central Virginia, where I am currently located. And Sophia Sinclair is a poet who was born in Jamaica and completed her Master's of Fine Arts in Poetry at the University of Virginia, where a few years ago, while she was a student, um, it was found that there were buried slave quarters beneath um, some student dorms, and particularly these very, what are known as very prestigious dorms on what's called the lawn, which is a large grassy area where the historic rotunda is, and students who live on the lawn, for students who live there, it's considered a great honor. And so she is talking about kind of the, the process of being a student on campus during this excavation and thinking about all of these juxtapositions. And so I'm curious what you think the speaker is feeling and what language in this poem um, she uses to convey her feelings and, and what lines or images really sort of illustrate the feelings that the speaker is expressing. What do you, what do you think she's feeling here? And feel free to leave your comments again in the comment area. And you can also feel free to talk about how you feel reading this poem. Are there lines that give you a certain feeling or really leave an impression on you? And if so, what is that impression? What is that feeling or sensation?
one person at first thought that the speaker was a surgical patient, which is interesting. Um, it, it does have sort of quality of, of dissecting in a sense and, and feeling exposed. I would say the speaker conveys this sense of being exposed in a way. And you kind of have language such as chainsaw, hymnal, excavations. Um, these are things that may kind of give you a, a flavor of surgery in another context. Someone's really um, impressed by the ghost arm of history still throttling me. That's an incredible line. Someone else says that the open wound really signifies the potential for healing that isn't yet realized. I think that's a great point. Someone says they're overwhelmed with emotion or the speaker's overwhelmed with emotion. Sounds like she's processing a lot of historical injustice. Absolutely. I'm particularly struck by the use of time in this poem as well. It's as if the speaker is hopping back from the present back 200 years. And again, it's sort of this time travel sense. Someone else really points out that how the line somewhere the ghost arm of history is still throttling me um, strikes them and that the speaker seems to be feeling the pain of slavery's impact on the land, absolutely. Right, someone else points out how she uses haunted towards the beginning of the poem and then hunted in the same line. To live here, we know precisely how to be haunted and to live here, we know precisely how to be hunted. That one, one letter difference. And someone else says, no one speaks of it. That line really conveys the sense of people being buried alive. Someone else says, it seems like the injustices are continuing on and haven't been reckoned with. Definitely, I think that's a, a big part of, of what Sinclair is trying to convey here in this poem. And someone is, is saying that she's showing how what happened in the past is still hunted today. Coughing in the aisles makes me think of infection. Right, that line certainly has a different meaning or connotation for us in the age of COVID. This was written and published back in 2016, but again, the poems are dynamic, so we can interpret things in different ways depending on the context in which we're reading them. Um, someone says, this is interesting, they thought the speaker was a ghost at a prison. And I definitely think there's a sense of ghostliness or a sort of ethereal otherworldly quality about the speaker. Maybe it's the time travel or some of the images that she uses, but it does sort of feel like the speaker is hovering sort of partly within the context of the present reality, but also partly on the outside of it in a sense. Somebody says the phrase Magnolia explosion really struck me a violent image in juxtaposition to the image of Southern gentility for sure. So I wanna move on to our, our next writing prompt. These are great discussion points. Thank you all for engaging. And I'd like you to think now about a place that has a particular meaning for you, but may have a very different meaning for someone else. And I should say the other context of this is that the lawn and the whole setting of this poem are generally considered to be very beautiful for a lot of people in this area and are often seen on brochures. And so the other thing that's interesting about this poem is how Sinclair really turns that on its head and examines what's underneath the surface. So imagine a place that has one connotation for one group of people, but for you may have a different connotation or a different experience. What does this place look, smell, taste, sound, or feel like to you? And how is that different from the way it sounds to up and, and looks to others? Um, you know, this is really interesting because for me as a healthcare provider, I think about often how the clinic space, the hospital space, these are places that feel very familiar to me. It's just where I go to work. But for many patients, it's a place they go once a year or maybe when only when they're feeling terrible and something really bad has happened. And it's a very unfamiliar and not intuitive place at all. And so I think a lot about how where I work, 
feels very different to the people with whom I'm working. And so I'd like you to think about a place like that, that is different for you than it is for other people who might enter that same space. And just jot down a few notes or maybe a few lines of a poem for the next two minutes, um, just thinking about that. Okay, so wrap up your last thoughts. We're going to move on. Um, I know that we're running a bit short on time, so we will not be able to go through all of the poems I, I laid out for you, but we'll just skip ahead a little bit. So um, the next poem I'm actually going to skip, but I want to encourage you to read it or listen to it later if you can. It's called ABC for Refugees by Monica Sok, S-O-K. And there is a an audio version of it also available on the internet. So feel free to Read that later on your own time. Next slide, please. And um, this poem, I really want you to think about an experience or with either a patient or being a patient, an experience with a healthcare provider where you felt that communication went poorly. What do you think happened? And think about some alternative reasons for that lack of communication. And then write a poem from that person's perspective, whether it's the patient or the provider about what happened using one of those alternative reasons. So I know you all have access to this presentation later, so you can feel free to kind of jot that down or just come back to it later um, when you have a chance to listen to that poem. But I wanna end on the next poem because I think it's quite relevant for 2020. And this poem is called The World Keeps Ending and the World Goes On by Franny Choi. I'm Franny Choi. This poem is The World Keeps Ending and the World Goes On, and it has a line borrowed from the poet Martin Espada. Before the apocalypse, there was the apocalypse of boats. Boats of prisoners, boats cracking under sky iron, boats making corpses bloom like algae on the shore. Before the apocalypse, there was the apocalypse of the bombed mosque, there was the apocalypse of the taxi driver warped by flame. There was the apocalypse of the leaving and the having left, of my mother unsticking herself from her mother's grave as the plane barreled down the runway. Before the apocalypse, there was the apocalypse of planes. There was the apocalypse of pipelines legislating their way through sacred water and the apocalypse of the dogs, before which was the apocalypse of the dogs and the hoses, before which the apocalypse of dogs and slave catchers whose faces glowed by lantern light. 
Before the apocalypse, the apocalypse of bees, the apocalypse of buses, border fence apocalypse, coat hanger apocalypse, apocalypse in the textbook's selective silences. There was the apocalypse of the settlement and the soda machine, the apocalypse of the settlement and the jars of scalps. There was the bedlam of the cannery, the radioactive rain, the chairless martyr demanding a name. I was born from an apocalypse and have come to tell you what I know, which is that the apocalypse began when Columbus praised God and lowered his anchor. It began when a continent was drawn into cutlets. It began when Kublai Khan told Marco, begin at the beginning. By the time the apocalypse began, the world had already ended. It ended every day for a century or two. It ended, and another ending world spun in its place. It ended, and we woke up and ordered Greek coffees, drew the hot liquid through our teeth as everywhere the apocalypse rumbled, the apocalypse remembered, our dear, beloved apocalypse. It drifted slowly from the trees all around us, so loud we stopped hearing it. So I want to point out how this poem was published in December 2019. So it was written before 2020, but if you're anything like me, you may be struck by how familiar this poem feels for the year 2020. And I really want us to think about with this poem, um, all of these sort of apocalypses or catastrophes that were happening for all of human history, essentially. Um, although for us, there's an immediacy to what's happening in 2020 that really feels, and, and for some people like the world is ending or that there have been major shifts and disruptions in our lives. And so we can go to the next slide for our writing prompt for this one. I want us to think about, you know, in that context, please write, do a free writing exercise. It could be poetry or prose about what changes you want to see emerge in a post COVID world. What are the opportunities or the silver linings offered by this pandemic for us to make positive social changes? What are the problems that have been brought to light? The apocalypses that maybe we were ignoring before 2020 that have now become very stark and real and write a poem imagining what that post-2020 world looks like. What is the change that's happened, the new system that's in place, um, the shift in the way we all think and, and act and treat one another that has resulted because of this pandemic and everything we've experienced in 2020. So let's take about two minutes to do that. Okay, so finish up what you're writing and we will wrap up there. I know we have just a few minutes and I wanna make sure I leave time for Q&A if anyone has follow-up questions or comments they'd like to make.
you can put them in the comment area and they will be passed on to me. So I'll just answer any questions you have for the next five minutes or so. So someone says, thank you for the wonderful poems, well chosen, and they enjoyed them and look forward to a new perspective on what they originally used to think of when they would think about poetry. So that's great. I'm glad to hear that. And that that's one of my hopes today is that you think about poetry a little bit differently and maybe are more interested in poetry after this workshop. And I know a lot of us can be very intimidated by poetry because often um, the experiences that we've had with high school English class, but Hopefully you will think about poems in a different way going forward. I do also wanna point out that um, I wrote an article for the blog Med Hum Chat, that's M-E-D-H-U-M-C-H-A-T all together. And it's about 10 poetry books that I recommend to healthcare providers and they're are obviously many, many, many more that I could have recommended, but I thought those 10 were a good place to start. Someone asked, what kind of poems are you writing or seeing being written about the events of this year? Interesting question because um, for me, I've had a really hard time writing poetry this year. I've actually found myself writing more creative nonfiction. And I think that's because poems for me are a way to ask questions and to sort of, um, figure out what questions I need to ask of myself or of the world. And this year has felt very rife with uncertainty. And I think for me personally, essays and creative nonfiction are a way of answering questions, although certainly they can ask questions as well. But I found something a little bit more grounding and for me wholesome this year in working on creative nonfiction rather than poetry. So I've written very few poems, but the poems that I have written have been about kind of the weirdness of time this year and how things seem to be moving both very quickly and very slowly. And particularly with the pace of the news cycle and everything going on. Um, but then at the same time, having these sort of stay at home, work from home, um, uprooting of many of our lives and lifestyles. People say, um, excellent poems, thank you. It's interesting to see how people express complex emotions. It really is. And it's also fun to play with language and figure out how you can express your own complex emotions. I think sometimes we have this limited vocabulary of, of language for our emotions. And if something feels more complicated than what that vocabulary allows, we often just don't express it or don't verbalize it, at least not with language. And poems sort of give us the opportunity to play around with things and make up a whole new way to express a more complicated emotion or experience.
Someone says they're enjoying the freedom of this kind of writing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the most fun things about poetry is that, as I said, there really are no rules. You can make up anything and it can be a poem. Someone says to tell us about the creative nonfiction. I'm writing a series of essays that I don't know where they will end up or what will happen with them, but they're sort of memoir and sort of based on um, kind of my contemporary life experiences and current events, but they're really about sort of those unspoken things that we we don't verbalize, whether they're emotions or histories or contexts um, that sort of inform and shape our lives in very specific ways. So for example, I wrote one and I read a section of one for Creative Mornings, if anyone's familiar with that series, um, that was about performance and the ways that we are often always performing, whether it's in our jobs or in our roles as parents or siblings or children or, or spouses or partners, and how that performance is not a bad thing, but something that we can be aware of and use that to be better at whatever it is that we're doing. Um, but we often don't talk about it as, as a performance because there's a sort of negative connotation. So there isn't really a more overarching theme or a bigger project for these essays right now, but it's just fun to, um, to explore some of these things that I've been sort of thinking about for many years. So I know that we're up to the hour now. So I just wanna thank you all for being here, for participating, for your enthusiasm. It's a bummer I can't see you all in person, but I know you're out there. So thank you very much. I think you're muted, Charlotte. I do that all the time, sorry about that. Um, I was just saying thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. And I am so with you on wishing we could all be together. Um, not the most important reason for the pandemic to end, but it would be a wonderful thing if we could all do this again together next year. Thank you so much. Um, so our next uh, presentation will begin in 15 minutes. Uh, this is the one that I uh, spoke about before with the uh, two uh, COVID survivors and the nurse practitioner um, who can talk about her experiences as well. So uh, take a break and we will see you in 15 minutes. Thank you so much.
Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for day two of the Inquirer's Telling Your Health Story conference. Um, my name is Elena Gure, and I am the Inquirer's opinion coverage editor. Um, so today we're going to be joined by three wonderful panelists who are going to talk to us about deciding to go public with their own personal health stories. Uh, so for these three folks, that meant opening up to the world about their personal experiences with the coronavirus pandemic, um, how that's gone for them and how their lives have or haven't changed since they shared their stories. Um, so before we dive right in, I just wanna go through some basic housekeeping stuff so we all know how the next hour is gonna go. Um, at any point during this panel, you all can submit your questions for the folks gathered here today um, using the little chat function that should be at the bottom of your screen. And when the panelists are done presenting, we are going to use as much time as we have um, to go through a Q&A session with three panelists. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the folks that are going to be speaking with us. So first, we've got Sasha Winslow, who is a nurse practitioner in New York. Um, hey, Sasha. Her plea for more pandemic support to healthcare workers went viral earlier this year and really started a conversation. Um, we'll also be joined by Maureen Boland, who is an English teacher at Abington High School and COVID survivor. Um, she wrote a really moving essay for the Inquirer about being hospitalized for the virus. Um, and then finally, we're joined by Jonathan Lippman, and he is a strategy and communications consultant in Philadelphia um, and a COVID survivor himself in his gripping op-ed for the paper about his and his son's experience with the virus opened my eyes and I think a lot of other folks to the experience of the long haul coronavirus. Um, so that's our great gang for the day. And um, first we're gonna hear from Sasha Winslow. Hi everyone, good morning from New York. Um, I would like to start off saying that I do have a five-year-old son, so if you hear a little scribbling, forgive me. <laughs> um, I would say earlier this year, it has been a whirlwind um, as a nurse, and it started off slowly. We were getting um, input from management that there were some cases coming into the hospital, and I worked with Mother Baby, which was postpartum. Um, and then slowly by slowly, we were getting deaths, people dying, um, staff members dying, and we were still on my side of the hospital only having regular masks. Many of us advocated for PPE, um, for ourselves to protect ourselves and our patients. And we were met with a lot of resistance or making so that we were just making things up, that we wanted to follow the guidelines, and it just felt like we were meeting, running up against the wall. At that time, um, I was a former delegate of the union in my hospital. And many of the rank and file members um, reached out to me to get other members on the unit to rally up, share what's going on, how they feel. And one thing led to another. And then I just remember being on TV. We were not expecting... Um, so many of the platforms that were present that day in, in April. We were motivated by the nurses at Jacoby Hospital who set off the stage of nurses coming out to promote the need for PPE. And when I wrote the sign that we would not be your body bags, um, I didn't think it would take off that way. I was expressing my fear and concern as a healthcare worker, as a mother, as a daughter, and to family members who are elderly, that no one should have to die if we are unable to protect you. If we, and we have the resources, people should listen to you. Um, when that came about, I definitely wasn't prepared for the trolls. Anytime you go public with things, your life is somewhat public now. And I'm a very private person. And I had weird followers on my Twitter account. Um, I had people using race, racist slurs towards me um, or talked about things that just was so irrelevant to what the nature was going on in the country and what many healthcare workers. And when I say healthcare workers, I talk about all of the people who contribute to the safety, the care, the 
the luxury of being comfortable in the hospitals from the nurses, the doctors, our PCTs, our housekeepers, those who do the laundry, those who make the food. We were all rallying up because we needed the equipment to better serve the people in our community. And I felt that wasn't happening. Um, I was very fearful of my employment after going on the news that I wasn't going to have a job when I go to work that night. And no one in management reached out to me, my manager, my director of nursing, the associate director, no one reached out to me. And I guess it was basically a out of sight and out of mind um, notion that they were promoting. But many of my staff, coworkers, um, were just so happy that I came out and spoke up about what was going on um, in the hospital that we still didn't have PPE. But because of us going on the news, that night when I went back to work after not sleeping after the news conference and doing another 12 hour shift, miraculously we received appropriate PPE. Um, and it's sad because it took us going to that extreme for us to feel protected by our employer. And um, it left me feeling disappointed and angry because when I became a nurse, I became a nurse because I love research. I love science. I love helping my community and representation matters. And what I saw within a big teaching institution, within a lot of these corporations was that when you're not in that level of management and you're just a staff member, you're just that another body on a totem pole. You're just another body. And it's unfair because we, we have families that we care and love for. You know, we have other things that we need to take care of and make sure that everyone in our circle is stable. Um, it didn't make sense in the beginning, but now we see with COVID cases rising daily throughout the United States that it's important we do not lose sight. We need to have the protective equipment to protect um, people and our patients. And we also, um, need to realize that due to the early COVID um, threshold, many people now have left. There is staffing shortage throughout. There is such a need for nurses at the bedside. Um, and many people, unfortunately, have left the profession because of not feeling safe to work. And... Um, I recently resigned from my position as a postpartum nurse for other reasons. And that was because I um, completed graduate school as a family nurse practitioner and my passion is in community health and women's health and trans health. And I took that opportunity to um, start another um, role and um, continue to provide care for people. Um, I'm glad to say that my current employer listens to the staff and we are provided with PPE to serve our patients. Um, it's definitely di different working outpatient versus inpatient, but it still remains the importance that we should not lose sight that COVID is still present, that people are still dying from COVID and that hospitals now in the New York City tri-state um, tri area are experiencing daily surges that we must take into consideration. Um, and even now with the possibilities of school closing again, um, it's like deja vu all over again. And no one wants to experience what was experienced earlier in the year of the COVID pandemic. So um, I'm grateful that I spoke up and I know that is power when people come together with a common goal, and that is to speak truth to power, that if you're silent, no one will be able to help you. No one will know what you need. And therefore, coming out and speaking your truth, though it's very anxiety-inducing and 
cause a lot of fear and you may get followers you do not want, but it's important that we all um, speak up and not be afraid to tell the truth. Well, Sasha, thank you so much for opening up with us today and for sharing what it's been like for you as a nurse um, throughout this pandemic. And now, you know, I would love for us to turn to Maureen to tell us a little bit about what her experience was like as a coronavirus patient and sharing that story with the world. Sure, my pleasure. And it's interesting because there are echoes of, you know, my story sounds very similar as a, as a teacher. Um, a little backstory, the week that uh, things were really heightening in March and coronavirus was becoming, um, uh, you know, such an extreme threat, Schools were in a flurry. I'm a teacher and there was a, a flurry of anxiety and we were told, hurry up, get ready. We may be closing. And I was asking as a teacher also, uh, similarly, a uh, union representative. I became part of the union because I saw how poorly teachers were treated. Um, could we get some hand sanitizer? Simple question. Could could teachers get some hand sanitizer in our in our rooms? Nope, can't afford it. And I said, this week, what we're doing during this flurry of activity is we're all spreading coronavirus. Sure enough, our school closed down on Thursday, and on Friday, I started with symptoms of coronavirus. Just a little backstory: um, I had trouble getting tested. I had trouble getting any appointments. I ended up getting worse and worse and ended up in the hospital and eventually almost put on a ventilator. And that's what I talk about in my story. And, um, you know, I, I felt, well, first of all, a little uh, disclosure. I was a magazine editor and writer before I switched careers and became a teacher. And I've been a teacher for the last 12 years. So I knew when I got out of the hospital and had almost been put on a ventilator. And we know now that at that time in March, 80% of uh, patients who were put on a ventilator, who were coronavirus patients, generally didn't make it off a ventilator. So I came dangerously close to um, almost losing my life. So when I came out of the hospital, I was reeling. I was absolutely reeling for days. It was a very traumatic experience. Um, and I, I knew I, I had a story. I knew I had a story to tell. And the question was, um, how do I package that story as a former editor? How do I package that story? Uh, what's the most helpful story to tell and how do I tell it? So, um, but before I even did that, I was reeling from the experience. In I hadn't gotten tested. I begged for testing. I knew I had coronavirus. I had been furiously reading about it as a former medical journalist. Um, I, I had trouble getting care. I got the wrong care. I uh, was put in a room for 13 hours without a nebulizer, without water, without food in the hospital. Uh, there are so many aspects of the story. So the question was, what can I safely and comfortably share? How can I be helpful with my story? Um, so it was how to package it. I knew there were some real headlines to it, some real takeaways, and that was first off that this was such an insidious disease and it was spreading like wildfire. I gave it to my student teacher, my, my children, my husband. There was a teacher two doors down who got it. I mean, it was clear that it was insidious. And as a fairly healthy person, it was uh, clear that it was um, so deadly because I almost, it, it could have taken my life. So, um, those were real big takeaways, but the, the biggest issue was doctors, nobody knew how to treat this virus. And um, in the hospital, there had been, let's just say, a lot of mistakes. I, medicine wasn't given to me when I was supposed to be given it. Um, I felt ignored. I felt if I had just had a nebulizer, um, that would have helped me. It, now, that said, I absolutely um, have the utmost respect for healthcare workers. I know that they were working so hard and doing the best they could. They were slammed. So 
the, the real question was, how do I tell this story and how do I tell it in helpful ways? I certainly didn't want to throw any healthcare workers under the bus. I felt for them. I wanted to honor them. And I knew how hard everybody was working. And also it was a delicate story because as a teacher who very likely got it from her school, um, I had my job to worry about as well. I had been vocal um, about concerns about our, our environment in school in general. Our school was under construction and uh, I had a lot of concerns. I had been vocalizing. It was pretty uh, perfect that I was the teacher who made the news for having such a serious case of coronavirus that I got from the school. So certainly had, I had to worry about my job in going public because I knew uh, my school wouldn't like that headline. Abington teacher gets deadly virus and spreads it to to her family and other teachers get it there. So I had to really uh, think about how to package and what to talk about and, and how to say it. So what I did was um, I, I kind of worked very closely with my editor uh, at, at the Enquirer who was very helpful. And I decided to go sort of a more emotional route, which was a challenge for me as a former medical a uh, writer and editor, I prefer sticking with facts and reporting and data. And instead I took an emotional route, which was really challenging because I was exposing myself. And as a teacher, you are sort of like a um, public figure. Uh, everybody would see it. I, uh, amazingly, I'm a dinosaur. I'm not on social media, nothing, not Facebook any of it. So I was really exposing myself, but I felt I had an important story to tell. And I thought that um, going sort of the emotional route, the, um, the isolation that I experienced being stuck in a room with no one to help me and just my lifeline was my phone and I couldn't even reach, the cord couldn't even reach so I could plug in. And my niece ran around and dropped off an extended cord so I could, that was my lifeline. I can't get water. I haven't got my heparin shot. I would call my husband and then he would call the nurse's station or um, try to get a doctor and say, why hasn't she gotten this? She missed her hydroxychloroquine today. It was really sort of surreal. So I decided to go the emotional route. And yes, I was exposing myself. Um, but I thought there was a story to tell about the fear and isolation and the unknown being what it was like being stuck in a room and seeing the flurry of activity and, um, you know, the, the people who are caring for me clearly not knowing quite what they were dealing with, which was was very scary. And again, I want to make it clear that they were working so hard, but it was so early on in the process. We've since learned so much more about coronavirus. Um, so I did go the emotional route. I talked about, um, you know, how isolating it was. I sort of sketch a scene of being in the tub when I when I get out of the hospital, trying to wash away the bruises. I was bruised up and down my body. Um, I had glue stuck to me from EKGs all of the time. It, it was um, sort of the scene I wanted to um, unpack. And I have to say that um, it, it was really, really beneficial to tell my story. I wanted to help people. I didn't realize how much it really did would resonate with people. I got hundreds of emails and texts. I got people wrote letters and tracked me down and sent me letters. Um, superintendents from other states um, wrote me. The head of our school board wrote me. It was interesting. And again, to touch on the whole idea of voice and being in the union, um, I feel like nurses. I have a sister who's a nurse and I have great respect. And I think um, a lot of people in healthcare aren't treated the way they should be and haven't had the PPE and et cetera, et cetera. Teachers are often um, don't have a voice. And that was one of my motivations for writing this story. And um, I did feel like one of the benefits, the takeaways was that uh, I was a little bit more heard. Um, 
in uh, going back to school. We're supposed to go back to school in the building over the next weeks. And as everybody knows, that's a controversial issue. I feel like because I told my story, maybe I'm listened to um, a, a little bit more. It also was incredibly cathartic to tell my story just from an emotional sort of psychic standpoint. And of course, uh, telling the story, I wanted to do that too for my students and to show them, like I show them in the literature that I teach, that uh, we can take traumatic, challenging events and do something productive with it, get the word out, um, which was really important in March when there were still, I felt a lot of people who were skeptical or didn't believe that it could happen to them. I got a lot of texts and emails that said, um, wow, I didn't really think this was a real thing, but I know you and you were so sick and now I know it is a real thing. So um, hearing that was helpful and just I felt showing my students how important it is to take something and try to take something that's been challenging and try to help others do something productive, not be a, a, a victim. Um, some sort of movement is, is better than nothing. Also, interestingly, I felt I had the scarlet C on, on me um, for having coronavirus. It was interesting when I did, you know, I went from walking a block when I was recovering to a few blocks. And as I would venture out, um, when people saw me, they would move back a little bit. They didn't want to get near me. Um, people didn't want to come to my house. It was it, it was interesting. There are aspects of it that I hadn't even accounted for, but um, net net, it was a really positive experience. I I feel like maybe in some tiny way I helped get the word out, and um, the story keeps changing. There's so many stories that come from it, and um, as as a teacher or a nurse, a lot of people right now who are put in the line of fire, uh, I think we have, have to always think about what is the next story and do we have the courage to tell it and how will we package it and how will we tell it so that maybe we can do some sort of, of good. Um, the story just keeps getting more and more complicated, I think, so. Yeah, well, one thing that really, thank you for that, Maureen. Um, and one thing that really struck me listening to both you and Sasha was how big of a role your emotions played in ultimately driving you to speak out and shaping the story that you chose to tell. Um, and John, I know that the last eight months have been an emotional roller coaster for you and your family. Um, so please tell us more about sure. that. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Elena. Um, and thank you, Sasha, for your work and for speaking up. I'm, I'm really in awe of the bravery that must have taken for you back at the beginning of the pandemic. It must have been, I just can't imagine how terrifying that must have been. And, um, you know, thank you, Maureen, too, for your bravery and for sounding the alarm in such a broad, visceral way. Your piece was really incredible um, and really kind of terrifying, frankly, <laughs> uh, to face it. Um, I had a very different experience. Uh, I was asked to be part of this panel, as uh, Elena said, uh, because I wrote a piece in September for The Inquirer about the journey my son and I have been on uh, with long haul COVID. Um, it's a journey we're still on. We're still sick. We're getting a little bit better uh, all the time, but we're, we're still really not better. Um, so thinking about this conference and why folks are here, I wanted to talk about just a couple of things. Um, sort of why I decided to tell my story, uh, the challenges I faced in, in as a writer uh, in telling it and how I solved them, and uh, the reward, you know, what, what the payoff. Um, so how I decided to sell my story, uh, my family all caught COVID-19 in March, right as the lockdown happened, right as I think uh, probably as, as Maureen got it. Um, my wife got it first, uh, followed by me and my son and my daughter. Uh, my wife and my daughter got better, but my son and I did not. We came down with what's now called long haul COVID. Um, I'm just going to briefly read from my essay to describe it because that's probably the best I've done it. Um, my cough and fever disappeared after two weeks but I was left unable to participate in my normal life. I woke up most days with severe pain in my limbs, like broken bones. I was so short of breath, I could not make it up the two flights of stairs in the house without gasping. Severe headaches would come and go. Complex mental tasks were impossible. I'd find myself reading and rereading the same email, unable to make sense of it. Worst was the crushing fatigue. 
Every afternoon, I would stagger to my couch and collapse asleep for hours in the middle of the day, regardless of the impact it had on my work or my family. I might feel better for a day or two, but I would inevitably crash again. My bouncy, sweet-tempered, irrepressible son, who liked to do handstands while watching cartoons, transformed into a morose ghost slumped in his bed. He cried if we suggested he go for a walk. So that was, you know, I was writing in September. That had been the case at that point for six months. Um, what really went along with that was this very frustrating experience of gaslighting uh, by the medical community, by the doctors. We didn't have positive tests for COVID to prove we'd been exposed. And so we couldn't really get anyone to take us seriously for, for months. Um, and at the same time, I was trying to keep working. So one of the things I do is I try to help people think through and place their own op-eds in newspapers, which is how I wound up on the phone with Elena, talking to her about a different piece. Um, I've worked with Elena before in pieces around racial justice. And I mentioned to Elena my story, what was going on with me. And I said, almost as a joke, I could write about it. And she encouraged me to not think of it as a joke, to take it seriously, uh, which I appreciate it. Um, I used to be a newspaper reporter, but I hadn't written anything at that point in my own voice for publication for over a decade. And so it, it made me very nervous. Um, I've worked for years now in the progressive movement. And I've helped shape messaging around the struggle for social, racial, and economic justice and climate justice. Um, so frankly, as a, as a well-off white man, I haven't focused on my own story or my own experience for years. It wasn't relevant to the struggles that I was focused on working on. So what I had to sort of do was recognize that I had to apply that same justice framework to my own story in a way I'd never considered because I was now someone struggling with chronic illness. And it was an unknown and invisible and not understood illness. And the system was not set up to help me. So, and if that was my experience as a privileged person, that was certainly even worse for people across the country without those privileges. And what we know is there are thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people struggling with long haul in the United States alone. So I realized that really I had a responsibility to speak up as somebody with advantages because I'm self-employed and I don't have a boss to worry about like Maureen and Sasha uh, did. And again, I appreciate your guys' bravery. Uh, you know, I, I could speak up and, and not worry about my boss finding out and, and getting in any trouble. So I tried, decided to approach the piece as a representative of the community I was now part of, this community of long haulers and to be a voice for them, which leads me to the discussion of the challenges I ran into. And problem number one was that my first draft was boring. It was just soups boring. I wrote out a pretty straightforward narrative, all the details, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And that's the way most of these first person medical accounts are written and that makes sense. It's a great way to teach people about a disease they don't understand. Maureen's piece is a stellar example of that. Um, the problem was that I was writing in September, several months into the pandemic. There had been thousands of these stories by then, many of them very good. And maybe my story was unique in particular ways. I was talking about long haul and introducing people to long haul, but it still wasn't nearly as dramatic or compelling <laughs> as Marine's story, for example. Um, I had not faced death, right? That was not part of my story. Um, so I tried rewriting the lead a few times, but at the end I decided to start over with two things in mind. Um, and it's interesting because they're similar to some of the things that Marie and Sasha talked about. One was to, ditch the focus in the narrative and to focus on the emotional impact. Uh, and two was to be strategic and to talk about systems. Now, obviously I didn't ditch the entire narrative. You can't do that in a first person story. You have to tell your story, but I didn't lead with it and it wasn't the focus of the piece. I trimmed down a lot of the detail and instead I focused on the way that uh, the long haul illness had had an emotional impact on my life because it's, it's different from acute illness and that you never really go back to normal. Your life is disrupted and it's grappling with that disruption that's as much as a part of it as anything. So I wrote and the lead to focus on the feeling I had, again, the sort of a theme here, loneliness and isolation. In this case, the sort of longer term loneliness and isolation. I was at home, I wasn't isolated from my family, which was a huge blessing, but I felt very isolated from the rest of the world. And I explored how that isolation was uh, increased because of the self doubt I was feeling and how that self-doubt was being fed by the way doctors didn't seem to believe me. And my goal there was to uh, give the audience something to relate to, even if they didn't have the same disease. 
but it also allowed me to talk about systems, which is to me what made the piece worth writing. I didn't feel there was much value to just displaying pain. Um, but if I was using that pain to illuminate problems within our systems, then I was doing work to help change those systems. So the focus of the piece became how the medical system was treating uh, me and my son. I talked about how uh, blood test data was treated as infallible, while my own experience of my own body felt routinely ignored. And those two goals, I think, led me to a piece that I felt had a more interesting structure and did more useful work than a straight narrative. And it had a great reward. Um, you know, we all know that humans like good stories, and we, we always have. And when you offer up, this is something I believe in my professional life very, very deeply, when you offer up a well-told story, it grabs attention and focuses the larger narrative in a very special way. You engage people emotionally or intellectually, you've taken up residence in their brain and you've changed their thinking. So that's why all the work that all of you are doing is so important. Just by being here, by being part of this conference, by attending, you are choosing to be people who improve your storytelling around health issues. And that's gonna be critical in this time. Um, and you never know where it's going to go because uh, if you got a chance to read my piece, you might have noticed I mentioned uh, CNN anchor Chris Cuomo as a fellow long hauler. He's been very public about having long haul. His people wound up seeing the piece and then they invited my son and I on air for an interview during his primetime CNN show. Um, I did okay in this interview. I was fine. Uh, my son was a rock star. He was nine years, he's nine years old and he was incredibly articulate. I was really very, very proud of him. Um, CNN liked it and they took my son's interview and they packaged it into a little news alert package. And then they tweeted it and they Facebooked it and they pushed it out to iPhones around the world. And it was seen by, I don't know, lots and lots of people. Uh, my cousins in India saw it. I was getting text messages from all over the place. Um, and we know that among the many people who saw it was Dr. Mike Ryan, who is the head of the COVID response team for the World Health Organization. He's based in Ireland. And he actually mentioned my son's experience in a live press conference he did a few days later. And he said, we have to learn from this and we have to learn to pay attention to the long haul impacts in children. That's about as big an impact as you could hope to have <laughs> from telling your story. I was very proud of him for doing that. Uh, and there's no way to predict that that was, was going to happen, of course, but I think it validates the worth of good storytelling and the way a good story can, can move a lot. So I thank uh, to all of you who are here for working to be better storytellers. Um, and thanks so much to Sasha and Maureen for, for doing that as well. Great. Well, I want to extend my thanks to all three of you again um, for being here today. I'm going to urge everyone listening out there to drop your questions in for the Q&A um, and you know, we'll roll along with those. But first I wanna start with one of my own. Um, so all three of you mentioned a wide range of responses to your stories, whether that's affirmation from people um, you know, who finally see what you've gone through and you know, can come back and say, oh, I went through something similar to people you know, walking a little bit away from you on the sidewalk, Maureen, or the trolls that you mentioned, Sasha. Um, I'm curious to hear, have you all been able to find community, whether with other essential workers or other COVID survivors um, that have helped you in telling your story since then? And you know, what has that been like? I will start uh, with, I had teachers reaching out to me. I had people who I you don't see in the workplace, those who work in the background that we never hear of. So whether it was IT, um, those who make sure that we had blankets and stuff for our newborn babies we were caring for, that they were just very proud that someone spoke up because they felt seen and they felt heard and that they were protected. And by being protected, they were able to protect themselves, the people they encounter, and most importantly, their, their family. So it was really good to see the, the positive of coming out and speaking because there's always two sides. There's the trolls and then there, there are those that keep you motivated to keep going, that they see you, that they hear you and they believe you. And that's the most important thing is for people to believe and respect that the experience um, changes your life. 
Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that. I loved my favorite comment when this, my story came out was I was I think I was called the drama queen, which I love. I got a kick out of. But um, just last night I was in the hospital with my mother and one of my students brought in the food. She's in college. She said, oh, my goodness, my old English teacher, Miss Bolin, uh, told me about her college experience and she's doing well. But she said, I saw you on TV. I read your story and um, I had COVID. And yes, it was horrible. And, there, and I said, and you're 20, right? And wasn't it pretty horrible? She said, yes, they're saying kids don't don't get extreme cases and yes we do i know so many young people i lost 10 pounds i it took me months to get better you know here i'm seeing another story like the whole story hasn't been told yet so it was just um it was an interesting moment seeing i had all kinds of moments like that people reaching reaching out um about it yeah i um I similarly had, you know, a lot of really great messages from folks and uh, random tweets and random Facebook posts and uh, and then a, a few trolls, probably not nearly as many as, as Sasha had to endure. Um, but the, the, the to me, the, the, the biggest impact was on my actually own personal network and circle, because um, as I sort of wrote in the piece, um, you know, at that time, long haul COVID was not really well understood or known or, and not understood broadly. So I had told people I was sick in March and by April, people were like, are you better? And I felt this tremendous social pressure to say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing better when I wasn't. And yeah. by May, I had just stopped answering the phone. I didn't talk to, I barely wanted to talk to my family, much less my friends, because the, the, the disbelief, the, you know, have you tried vitamins, you know, Maybe you're just tired. Maybe you're just stressed. Those kinds of questions, I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, and you know, trying to tell people, no, I'm still sick with coronavirus. Yes, it's the third month. No, I don't understand it either. No, I don't have a positive test. I can't. You know, yes, I've seen the doctor. No, they don't have answers. I couldn't go through that anymore. When I wrote this piece and was able to lay out sort of my whole story, um, just the response from my own friends and family was probably, in some ways, the most important thing. Um, I stopped having to defend myself. I stopped having to explain myself because um, I put it out there in this very definitive uh, uh, way. Um, and it really let me kind of re-engage with my own circle. And that was, in, and in the end, it's been probably the biggest reward. It was validating, I'm sure. I know I got it in March and I had months of symptoms that I wasn't reading about. So I remember seeing your piece and saying, ah, yes, my arms and legs ached for months. I had heart pounding. That's long haul. Yeah. <laughs> for months. And no one was talking about it. Like, you're better, right? Um, so I, I found it validating to see that piece. Thanks. Well, that's great to hear. Um, that you all were able to create some validation for each other. And I just wanted to share some of the comments we have from our listeners. Uh, Maureen, one person said that your story was the first time that they saw the face of a young person affected by COVID. Um, and that commenter thanks all three of you for sharing. And another person who identifies um, as a nurse said, you know, you are all impacting so many in a positive way. I just wanted to share that. Um, and then, you know, while we still have time, I want to move a little bit <laughs> from the warm and fuzzy briefly, um, just to say, you know, one thing that I found really compelling in all of your narratives was just communicating this really well-earned frustration um, with leaders both in medicine and you know extending to politicians. So can I do a temperature take of all three of you with your frustration now um, as we stare down the third wave of the pandemic? Where, where are y'all at? <laughs> it, it is a, it's a mixed ball of confetti where I'm at right now um, because it's still this, naive belief that okay it happened in march that's it it's over you know people are still don't wear a mask some wear a mask somewhere incorrectly um i feel i'm like in the middle of the frustration i'm learning to not take so much on around me um i'm learning to focus on the things that i can control and that's 
my behavior and how I react to things. Um, all I can continue to do is just um, <laughs> make sure that I take time for myself. And if you see someone behaving what they're not supposed to with everything COVID, cross street, walk away. I think safety is so important for all of us and we need to um, take heed in that as we enter into winter. Um, I, I can add to that. I'm really frustrated as a teacher soon to go back into the building with the numbers climbing and climbing and climbing. And I'm going on saying, look at the data. Um, I was in a, uh, in a conference, two teachers from my school were invited all schools in the area to, to the uh, Monco conference and the CHOP policy lab was there two weeks ago telling us how safe it is for us to go back to school and just like it's safe in the hospitals. And uh, I thought, am I living in the twilight zone? And um, a another issue is part of why I felt so compelled to help tell my story in March was that uh, I couldn't get a test. Testing was still, we're in November and students and teachers are going back to school and we are not doing testing. We're not doing any random testing. I, I don't understand that when we hear politicians say, yes, we're doing testing, we know so much. We're not, we're going back into the classroom, classroom voting and students will not be tested. So if, if we followed the rules that they really suggest, maybe we could do it somewhat safely in a hybrid setting, but there's no way public education can follow those rules in this country. It's a big lie. People don't, the politicians who talk about it, people have no idea how public schools in this country function and how short we are on supply. Just like Sasha talks about the PPE experience, we couldn't even get soap and toilet paper and any supplies in our bathrooms. So it, it's, it's a farce to think that we can do it safely um, in public education a different story in, in, in private schools, et cetera, but not in public education. It can't be done safely. There are no resources. So I'm angry about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a pretty political person, so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty incandescent with rage, pretty up to, <laughs> it goes to 11, right? Um, to me, this is such a failure of, leadership that actually stretches back decades. Why are we at, why do we have a public education system that when kids are healthy, cannot get soap? That's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous choice of priorities by a leadership in this country over decades that now that things are, are a problem are leading us to these impossible choices. Uh, you know, why is it that Sasha has to go on TV to demand leadership and leadership isn't stepping up to provide? That was true then and nothing has it's gotten worse since then. So, I, I mean, I think the complete lack of national leadership on this, you know, there, there's an economic relief bill that's been stuck in, stuck, excuse me, stuck in the Republican Senate, I'll be explicit, uh, for months with no action, uh, as if the economy's fine, as if people are just all back to work and everything's normal. We should be paying people to stay home. And instead people who know it's not safe are going to work because that's the only way they can pay their rent. I, I am, I think we have, I think there's been tremendous, tremendous failure of leadership and I don't see it turning around uh, right now, right when things are about to get really bad. And I'm scared, I'm scared. We're, we're as a family, even though we are probably immune because we've probably had it, but no one can tell us because the science doesn't say, mm -hmm. um, we're gonna lock down, we're, we're canceling Thanksgiving, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're not gonna be doing anything really social probably for the next several weeks. And that's really sad, um, but I don't see any other way when the community isn't being protected by its leaders. Well, everyone, we are coming to the end of our hour. I wish I had another hour to talk more about the messages you all would want to get out so eloquently to the public. Um, but thank you so much to our three panelists for talking to us today. I want to thank all of the viewers for joining us. Um, and I want to remind everyone to stick around this afternoon for 
um, the Telling Your Health Story conference keynote speech. It's going to be coming from Philly-based writer Lorraine Carey, um, who has documented all kinds of aspects of Philly life, but will be talking specifically about her memoir that charts her caretaking for her grandma. Um, so that's going to be coming up in about 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. Stick around for Lorraine and hopefully we'll see you later.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. You know, for a while, we weren't sure that we would be able to do Telling Your Health Story this year because of this uh, worldwide pandemic. But eventually, we figured out a way to do it. And so then the first thing I thought was, well, who's going to be our keynote speaker? Uh, last year, we had a marvelous uh, physician writer, uh, Sunita Puri, the uh, author of That Good Night, Life and Medicine in the 11th Hour. And I thought this year, why don't we look for a writer who is also a caregiver, because caregivers uh, are the unsung heroes in so many health stories that I thought, hmm, what can we do? So I started asking around, and one name and one book kept coming up. Now, when I heard the name Lorene Carey, remember this was back in January, I think, January, February. No, no, actually, no, this was March. It was after the pandemic started. Anyway, when I heard Lorreen Carey's name, I immediately thought about her play, My General Tubman, which had just had a sold out run at the Arden Theater in Philadelphia, and they were extending it until COVID shut it down along with everything else. But my General Tubman is just the beginning of the many amazing uh, stories and books and, and other projects that Lorraine Carey has been uh, providing us. She's an award-winning instructor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, whose numerous books include a memoir of her time at an elite boarding school, um, Black Ice. Um, her very first novel, The Price of a Child, which told the story of an 1855 fugitive liberated from the Philadelphia Ferry, um, was chosen as Philadelphia's first ever one book, one Philadelphia selection. She also is the founder of Art Sanctuary, an organization that uses the excellence of Black arts to enrich our region. And more to the point for our purposes today, she is the author of a wonderful memoir about caregiving and a whole lot more. I picked up Lady Sitting, My Year with Nana at the End of Her Century, and within a few pages, I was completely hooked on Nana and also on Lorene. So I reached out to Lorene and I waited. And then I waited a little more because it turns out that Lorene was incredibly busy because on top of everything else that she does, she and her students at Penn have been busy with their project, Vote That John, which is dedicated to bringing out first time voters to the polls. In fact, in the 2018 election, I believe that they succeeded in doubling the number of first time voters. Um, fortunately for us, we are now past the 2020 election. And so we get to welcome Lorene Carey to telling your health story. Hi, Lorene. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks for that. I, I don't I don't know that we doubled it. We were part of doubling. Okay. <laughs> Certainly. Oh, thank you. Thank you to the inquirer for this conference. Thank you for that um, introduction. All right. You know, um, caretaking stories like like all stories. It's interesting you talk about the different scope of stories that that I love to tell and 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 that that we've been talking about. I love that this conference is talking about uh, poetry and story slams and uh, journaling and all the ways you tell. You figure out what your story is, and then you figure out how best to tell it. Um, like all stories, this one I hope, Lady Sitting should should help you should tell you how to read it or take it in or or think about it um charles dickens in a christmas carol says to us you must believe in ghosts or else this story will make no sense so you know he tells us right away that's that's how you have to take the story in um my my story is about a charmed uh childhood with a grandmother uh, and how that that childhood, like all of our childhoods, comes into is is the groundwater underneath our our grown up lives. Um, what I ask the reader is is to please understand that to experience the reversal, you have to bring in your own 
your own life, your own own experiences and the times when there was that urgent uh, mashup of of love, love and fear, which is what you get at the end of the life, uh, along with, um, depending on the characters involved, along with hope, along with dread, along with anger, along with regret. These these are the stories that we're telling about the end of life. So. Um, the stories can be trivial, they can be ultimate. In this excerpt, and I think before you talk about a book, you should read a little bit of it. Uh, in this excerpt, in Lady Sitting, what I've tried to do is is layer the many stories um, that we were we were telling each other, um, even as our life together was happening, even as uh, as we were trying to f figure out how to handle uh, Nana's end of life, her her ups, her downs, our capacity and our lack of capacity, which is always part of the story um, when you're caretaking. Of course, the story begins in the body. Uh, it ends in our understanding of the ultimate, whether that's the divine or or just final rest. This is from chapter 10 and it starts after the excerpt that the inquirer uh, put in about, about the Medicare debacle. Um, Nana had had a, a terrible experience. She'd had a stomach problem. There was lots of diarrhea. We couldn't stop it. Um, and very quickly she'd gotten dehydrated, gotten weaker. Uh, and I was unable to get her to the doctor because her Medicare had been frozen. Um, we got it back. She got better. Next step. As I searched for ways to tell how it felt to have Nana in the house. Yep. I do mean that as a reference to Elvis in the house or Tupac in the house or some other dead celebrity who leaves afterglow energy. As I try to describe her presence, the metaphors I find seem to require water, a shallow fog had rolled in, or better yet, a frozen ice crystal appearing in the landing that caught the light in new ways and made me shiver. That tracks better with my dreams of winter, as if I were snowed in unexpectedly, like when Pop-Up forgot my boots and I had to wear Nana's two big galoshes to go out and play on the porch. But unlike those days when Nana would fix things, now it was my porch and death was on the horizon and I couldn't fix it. Nana did not want to know. Her body knew, however, and like animals sharing a den, our bodies too felt it. But Nana was not readying herself. The heroism of triumph over death again, ha, still there. She could not help but enjoy a slightly congested chuckle. But this Nanitude, as we called her attitude, this Nanitude no longer served her current challenges. Underneath her pride ran a current of anxiety. And when I relaxed into the complicated present moment of Eucharist at church with the Sunday school children drawing or asking for candy or putting on my bracelets or helping or taunting each other, I felt how susceptible I had become to that current of anxiety. A year or two before, my father and I had tumbled into an unexpected swirl of conflict about this almost die, could die, don't let it happen. I was walking the dog at night and making calls. This was when Nana was still in her house and dad and I had set up a schedule so that one of us went there every evening. My husband and children came once a week as we'd done for years. My sister with her two little babies living two hours north came just as often as she could. Dad and Nana had already had their seven years without speaking. 
Their separation ended with a tearful reunion onto which Nana placed the strict condition that they never talk about what had passed. I told her then that I would have insisted on two years of couples therapy and that if she wanted to reconsider, I could recommend someone. She thought that suggestion hilarious. We laughed together, but separately. But right, whatever. Dad came onto the duty roster and I thanked God. In fact, Dad and I didn't talk much to each other either, except about what was in the fridge, or light bulbs, and doctor's appointments. Always doctor's appointments. When, with whom, where, who would take Nana, how to manage the information sharing among doctors and ourselves, how to keep on top of mortality. It was an existentially stupid phrase because mortality always stays on top, no matter what. Each month, Nana debated whether to let her hair grow out, asking me whether it was ridiculous to keep coloring it, especially when going down into the basement where we did her hair, got so hard. Oh, nothing says we can't die it upstairs, I said. Oh, thank God. <laughs> we spoke no more about that just as we didn't talk about the other losses that piled up and crowded each present moment. Each doctor's appointment became a philosophical question and with everyone involved, morphed into a group therapy. If this specialist finds a problem that can only be solved by extreme medical rendition, perhaps too hard on the rest of her body, or likely to make other things to break down, like a high-powered new carburetor stuck into a 1954 Ford in a Havana room, a Havana street somewhere, whose radiator is strapped in with a piece of a coat hanger. What does one answer? If a person such as Nana, who distrusts doctors, wants to ignore their advice, but comes up with her own prescription, that requires the unqualified family member caretaker to act against conscience or beyond competency, what does one do? If the family members disagree about problem solving and have no, no practical habit of collaboration on life-threatening emergencies, how do we proceed? Nana believed her increasing deafness was a matter of impacted earwax, for instance. What she wanted me to do was warm sweet oil. Go to the drugstore and get some sweet oil. Pour it into her ear, and then the next day, find some way to remove the wax with a bobby pin. These were our daily, weekly, monthly garden variety conflicts. But once, when Nana was still in her house, Dad rang me while I was walking the dog. It looked like he, walking the dog, and told me he was worried about the appearance of one of her many moles. It looked like one he had spied on his girlfriend. She had gone to the doctor, found it to be malignant, and had it removed. So he wanted me to be sure to get her to see a specialist ASAP. We had two appointments lined up, which was as many as I thought I could handle. I'm not sure what I said, but it was definitely a delaying phrase of some kind. I remember the warm evening, the sound of rocks under my feet, and how much I wanted not to talk anymore and just walk silently. My father shouted at me by, shocked me by shouting into the phone, this thing could kill her. Daddy, I said quietly, trying to pull back from wherever we'd suddenly arrived. Nan Nana's 99 years old. Even after the diarrhea episode, Nana had tricked the devil again, as the saying goes, which is only funny when one is speaking theoretically. Did Nana believe in the devil, a literal presence presiding over a literal hell? I couldn't tell. What I did not doubt was that each close call weakened her immune system and left her more anxious to reestablish homeostasis or some new balance on the high wire that her life had become. Still, she'd outlived the hospice limits 
And so now we had no weekly nurse visits, no nurse on call, and no nighttime backup. I was supposed to have given back the medicine box in the back of the fridge, but I couldn't face elder care without a net. In case of calamity, I'd need to be able to administer a few drops of that morphine. And she was frail enough now that calamity lived with us too. I take the time to, to read that just to give you a, a, a sense, those of you who are take, caretaking, give you a sense that every single person who is doing this caretaking is experiencing those layers of difficulty, of fear, um, of stories. And, and when you're writing about it, th there needs to be a way to pull in all those stories from the story of the Christian Eucharist to the story of the Last Supper and the mandate to love one another, uh, to the stories of family conflict Often that's the, the hardest part to, to say honestly and, and with love. Um, and, and to stories as well that, that really do um, connect to the larger, larger world. Every bit of your story right now has to do with COVID. Every bit of this story when I read back almost seems quaint that we could have people just come and go. Almost seems like some, mm, some other time, like when you see photographs of people all together without, without masks. Um, for me, the story continues to go closer and closer to the, the, the core, which is how do we keep giving love how do we keep receiving love? And where is our empathy selective? We know it is anyway. We know that this is, this is where the context comes. This is why I had to include in it Nana's uh, constant asking about, um, about uh, Barack Obama and the first, his first run in 2008, Nana would say, oh, how's our young man doing? Um, Nana had been a Republican all of her life, by the way, um, coming up from the South, running away from Jim Crow Democrats. She was a, um, she was a Republican from the 1920s all the way through. She wasn't sure she could switch, but mm, maybe, maybe she might for our young man. The context of that has everything to do with the way our family faced this time together because she brought into our lives that childhood that had come to Philadelphia from North Carolina during the time of Jim Crow, that had come with a, a father who had all kinds of ambitions that were crushed, in fact. Uh, by the Jim Crow uh, time in North Carolina, um, by someone who had had uh, a farm and money and then lost it all in the depression. All of that came into our lives when Nana came. In addition, of course, caretaking also brings in all of the other caretaking one has ever done. You have learned, just like when you raise children, right? You've learned what to do with that person, maybe. You've learned where you failed. You've learned where you didn't have enough. And then now this next one comes and you're lacking in other ways that you didn't know. Uh, I think all of that goes into our story. So the, our personal, what we have, to bring to this, the person we're caretaking, and then the context of that um, caretaking all goes into it. For me, the question was um, how to keep loving, how to give love and receive love. Was Nana capable of intimacy? What would I do 
if she wasn't? What is love, right, essentially? How do you, how do you do it? How do you, how do you do your duty? What's your duty? What does love say? That's why I had to keep bringing it. My husband's a clergy. We were living in the rectory of our church. Um, the, the whole point of the, the Last Supper that's always every communion, which is love ye one another. Well, what if, what, if we're, what if we don't? What if we thought we did, but we don't? What, what, what do we do with ourselves? And how do we help? Um, the, the, the opera that I wrote about the story was very clearly just about that. Opera can do that. It can take that one thing and it just, it blooms. It, it, <laughs> I say that now, I, I've always said opera blooms and, and I learned that with the American Lyric Theater where I, I learned about writing the Brettos a few years ago and they talked about a, an idea of blooming. And I always thought about roses, but the, the other day I thought about those, you know, those onion things that some restaurants have where you fry it and poof, they go like that. that that's that's sort of how it blooms too right just big and buxom and full of ideas um and that that really was about about love again looking at your story slam and your poetry and your journals and what do you do like what is the story and what do you need to be told right then i needed to explore um did she love us did we love her? Until what? Under what circumstances? Until it got how hard? Now what? Now do, what do you want? Now um, the, the play I'm writing, uh, thank you Charlotte for mentioning uh, my General Tubman, the play that I'll be writing from this, again for that wonderful Arden Theater we have, the play will be more complicated. It's not just about what do I love? But it uses memoir. And really a memoir's question is not just about her, but also about oneself, right? We say to the people who are listening, look at this world through this little broken piece of glass. Look, look at the world here. If you look at it through my glasses, what do you think? Doesn't Does it, does it look kind of crazy to you? What, what do you think? That That's what, that's what we're, we're doing and you and you try to get it toward them you also try to get it into the body or as alternative medicine says the body mind the body mind what's the mind doing what does this this illness have to do with depression or anxiety and very specifically the kinds of things that medicine can tell you okay it looks like she's getting more dementia hey get oxygen to the brain poof roll back five years wow wow telling your health story my my goodness get her that oxygen and everything changed I found it excruciating, as the passage I read said, to negotiate, and my sister and I have talked about this many times, to negotiate being compliant in helping the loved one keep control, even though that meant lowering her st the standards that she lived by. She insisted on having a bucket next to her bed because she didn't want a potty chair to um, mess up her decor. Okay, um, all right. She insisted on uh, eating food that was less nourishing than we believed she needed. Um, so when, when she moved in, a lot of those worries changed, but we had to then negotiate her, what, how she would have enough control to live as an adult, because she still was. Um, telling that story um, for me was 
was also difficult because it means that I needed to, that's why I had to do it as a memoir instead of something else, because I needed to say, well, well, where's my own control issues, right? Where, where, where are they? Um, what I'd like to do, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to uh, t talk about this without ending um, ending with saying that this, what I'm not doing is setting up a false hierarchy. Everybody in America, if you, uh, all the polls, and these are really good polls, look at, ask people how they want to die. Everybody wants to die, like a Victorian uh, book, like those pictures they used to have on cookie tins uh, in Victorian time. And there's a person in the bed and everyone's around and all the children and grandchildren and um, maybe a few pets, right, are curled up. There was a pet in our story too, Angus, who nobody really liked Angus <laughs> as much as Nana did. I think they were both, they were both a little grumpy and they got along very well. But what I don't want to do is say, yes, that's right. And set up some idea that we did it right and, and care in the facility is wrong. We're definitely afraid of that now. We've seen that facilities that are underfunded, just like our schools that are underfunded, cannot do the job well. That does not mean, however, that keeping your loved one home is always a better idea, just like it's not always a better idea to homeschool, right? You People make their decisions and all, but it does not mean that there's a hierarchy and this is better and this is, this is somehow less than. What, what we found um, at the end of Nana's life when we were no longer capable of, um, of keeping her, of keeping her, of keeping her safe, of um, she stuck one night, she stuck her leg through the, um, the, the hospital bed that we had in the house and she was stuck there. Had she wrenched the wrong way, she could easily have broken her hip um, we had no way of helping with this, of, of doing this better. Um, I asked the hospice uh, nurse that very night uh, because I was so afraid. I had fallen asleep and was not able to be on, um, on guard anymore. Uh, I asked the hospice care if they would allow us to bring Nana for their five-day respite. They had a family respite service. You could bring bring your loved one in for five days. Um, the nurse said to me, oh, your grandmother will definitely thank you for this. She'll love it. I said, no, she's going to say that we abandoned her. She's going to say that everybody has to take care of themselves at the end of life, at the end, no matter what the relationship is, at the end of it, you're really on your own. We tried so hard not to, to counter that narrative, to let her know she was not on her own, that she had helped create a family that would care for her. Um, and I, I, I was afraid that this would, in fact, mm, confirm her. But here's the fact. I did it anyway because I could no longer, I had, I had no other resources. I reached down and all of us working so hard, none of us had any other resources. When, after three days, they allow you to come visit. They say don't come visit before the third day because otherwise, you know, it's like calling your kid at camp, summer camp after the first night. Um, we went the third day and this is what I found. On Monday, Bob drove us to the hospice wing of Holy Redeemer's sprawling medical campus outside Philadelphia. 
I love, I love reading this in Philadelphia because everybody knows exactly where I'm talking about. The reception nurse led us to a family waiting room. It was modest and private. We waited while they brought her. She was dressed in warmer, comfier clothes than hospitals usually provide. Without glasses, earphones, or oxygen, she looked vulnerable, more like herself. I came close so she could hear me. Nana, I said, still dreading the response I knew was coming. It's Lorraine, and Bob's here too. We've come to see how you're doing. She looked at my face, very close to hers now. The anxiety mask was gone. Somehow, the geriatric psychiatrist had found exactly the medication cocktail to soothe Nana's fear and return her to herself. With muscles at rest, her face could now register several emotions in a row, confusion, disbelief, surprise. She looked back and forth between us to confirm and then reached around my neck and pulled me to her. Oh, honey, she said, I was afraid you'd never find me. You won't believe where I've been. Then for the first time since she began this last leg of her life, Nana herself cried. I'm going to stop there uh, and see if you would like uh, talks, questions, please. Thank you. Lorraine, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, invite the audience to drop some questions in the chat here. And um, while people are doing that, um, I thought maybe you and I could. Uh, oh, here we go. We already have a, a <laughs> coming in fast. I like it. Great. Caregiver for a decade, first with my dad, then with my mom. Your words about Nana and family dynamics mm -hmm. ring so very true. Thank you for sharing your lived experience. Well, and, and that was what I wanted to ask you about. Um, it took you how many years um, after Nana's death to finish this book? I'm, I'm not judging, just asking. Right. <laughs> um, the fact is I didn't start it until um, maybe 10 years after she died. It's not that I spent that 10 years writing. It was mm -hmm. that there was, this was not something I could have done earlier. Tell me about that. Did, did you always think you wanted to write about it or you just thought, no, I can't do this? But it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't on the, on the list. I did have, I had a couple little bits I had written. I wrote a little nugget about her, uh, the snack. Right. Every night I left a snack. Yeah. So, so I did that. I just thought, well, maybe I'll send that someplace, you know, as a little piece. Maybe I'll do a blog. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did not expect to do a, a whole story about it. Yeah. What what inspired you to tell the entire story and, and also to have so much. What I loved about it also was the, the very rich context about your family history, your, mm -hmm. your family's life. Mm -hmm. um, what, what got, it's very funny uh, where I am, there's a window and the light changes. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing all this light and it, fe that's how it felt to me. It felt oh. as if, um, phew, suddenly things had changed. Uh, I did a, I did yoga. I decided that I needed to really get, um, get, deal with some, a lot of pain. I had a lot of pain in my body. Mm. Uh, I went to a yoga class with my older daughter and she said, mommy, you know, you need this, right? Mm -hmm. I got into a position and I burst into tears. Uh -huh. Just, just, and, and I said, well, <laughs> what, what, what the hell was that about? Like that? Mm -hmm. And she said, mommy, you need this. You need this. You need to go back home and do this. Cause I was with her in Vermont. So uh, I did. And after two years, maybe of practice, uh, I had a I had a serious practice going. I went every morning and did Ashtanga and it was 
wonderful. You're doing an hour, hour and a half of yoga morning. And it was, um, and at one point I got into a, this position I write about, you know, you get there and, and what you're doing is you're forcing air into places it hasn't been. Wow. Uh, I got there and suddenly it was Ash Wednesday. And I heard Nana's breathing at the end. I heard that rattle, that death rattle. I, when I breathed into my own lungs deeper, that's what I heard. And I, that's when I knew I had to write about it. Amazing. Oh, we've got some nice comments here from people. Let's see. Um, I'm now thinking about the last few months of my own grandmother's life. She didn't remember much, but she remembered me. <laughs> I was away at college. She was at, let me see, when someone introduced a new dance instructor named Tiffany, my name, her eyes lit <laughs> up because she thought it was me. Oh, wow. 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 There's, there's one just a little bit above that, too, that above yes. that. Let's see. Ah, uh, yes. These little things, moments like removing earwax. <laughs> That's nitty gritty. Um, <laughs> communicating with relatives at different levels of understanding of where you are in a person's mortality, small conflicts, they all feel like deaths. Yes. Those lawyers beat you so much more than an actual death. That relationship with your father, oh, that, that, that is... That, that had to be, it seems like it must have been very difficult to write about, was it? Yeah, I didn't write about it at first. I didn't. And my editor said, uh, what's up with this hole in the book? Hello? <laughs> that sounds like an editor. <laughs> it was great. It was, she, she found the hole. This is why, this is why God makes editors. I edit. You know, when you read something, you say, oh, I see. Wow. It's just like wa watching somebody, when you read a piece, and there's something that's not there. It's like watching somebody walk down the street and walk around something. And then they come back and you say, well, what was up when you got to 20th Street, you walked around, what was there? Wow. It's, how, do we, how do we love? When does it happen? Wh what are we afraid of? How do we, what do we do together? Hmm. That, you know, their, their time not talking and then, then his seeing that mole and, and yes, the doctor did say to us that mole had started its journey toward malignancy. And the doctor said, however, she's 99. I doubt that she, that the cancer can catch up to her. It probably will, she will probably die of something else before that. So that's your choice. Leave but how it. fascinating that your father decided it, it, it maybe he needed that one detail to anchor himself. We needed many, many, many things mm. to anchor ourselves and each other. Also to, to, to actually talk together about something. Besides mm. what time are you here? Okay, I'll be there. Five, I can't be there. 530. No, no, I left another year. No. Oh, God, not that yogurt in the back. I know she made me keep that yogurt. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> you throw that away. You saw that thing with the with the green hang. Oh my God! Yeah, right, right. No, I don't have any. Not, I don't. I don't. Oh, do you have the light bulbs? Oh, that's great. Right. I mean, besides that, we didn't talk. So, at, so how do you really? I keep doing this. I keep, you know, doing that. Right. And he started coming to church to my my husband's church. Mm -hmm. And then he would come on uh, Sunday afternoons and go upstairs and sit with him. Wow. It was, and it was like an, like an entrance into the time together. Hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Lorene, um, this is a very nuts and bolts kind of question, but I think it's one that probably a lot of people in our audience have. Mm -hmm. If you've never written a book before, how do you get started? Um, you get you get started accepting that you can't write a whole book. 
it's so hard. What um, you get started the same way you cook. You know, you want to do a big Thanksgiving dinner. You look at the cooking shows, and they blah blah blah. But for real, for real, you've just got to do that one thing. You know, my husband, when he's naughty, when I'm not doing well, says mm, one word. It's still one word at a time, huh? <laughs> Hmm. Yes, it is. So what you do first is you find some way to, to put into your life an opportunity to let yourself fail a lot at writing it. Hmm. So whether that's half an hour in the morning or taking your lunch time to write because you don't really want to, you know, talk to people anyway, or, or attach it to something, attach it to brushing your teeth at night. So when you're going to brush your teeth, just, you just take an, an extra 20 minutes, like find some way to make it regular six times a week, give yourself a Sabbath, right? And put that in. Take away a TV show, take something, there's some, if, because otherwise what you'll do is your mind will constantly be trying to come up with this whole thing instead of letting yourself start where you are, like the Buddhists say, and just do some. And then you mess up. It takes me about 200 pages to write my way to the door of a book. Huh. It's very wasteful. My process, so I'm, if you, if you, th probably everybody here wants to write a book will be less wasteful than I am in the writing process. I take all kinds of inspiration from going to the Bay in April and watching all of those horseshoe crabs come up onto the beach and lay their eggs and all the migrating birds eat them all up. That's how my first pages are. Hmm. And I, I just have to keep writing and writing until, until I hit the thesis, until I know what it's really about, until I can really be honest. Wow. And the internal honest story with this, with me was, okay, Nana, you thought, you thought Nana just loved you to death. I use the cliche, you know, pointedly. Um, what if, but, but one of the things you discovered when she lived with you was that Nana kept her internal idea that at bottom, it's everybody for himself. When, when I said to Nana, I can't, you're here. We've got the church and my younger daughter was still home and, our older daughter had moved into Nana's house because the house was empty. And, you know, first of all, it's an old house. If you don't flush the toilets, it'll fall apart. But also if you leave it empty, theft, I mean, okay. So I don't have a boiler in that house. What a great detail. I love the boiler. <laughs> well, Please read the book if you want to hear about the damn boiler. But oh, yeah, everyone's got to read the book. Yeah, you got to hear about the boiler. <laughs> our, our, our daughter moved in because that was the big worry thing. Like I couldn't go over twice a week and do the boiler and and we paid somebody to cut the grass and you shovel the sidewalk and all. Well, she was in her 20s. She worked here in town. It meant that she left. You know, if you're at 24 years old, and some of your friends want to go out and have a beer. They're not going to come. You, say, you can't say come over to my suburban two-story. No, nobody wants to come across the, no. Yeah. So, but she had to get back and her dog was there. And so all of that, like, um, Nana just, she couldn't think of, of us. She could only hold on to, when, when I said to her, would, could we please sell the house? Nana's response to me was, not, no, not ironically, was, well, honey, what if you and Bob put me out? Where would I go? Really? 
You say that to my face. And for real, for real, that's what Nana thought. And I, I could not show her that it hurt me. And I thought, well, grow up. Grow up. <laughs> that's hilarious. This is who she's been. Grow up. So, yeah. Well, this has been such a pleasure, Lorraine. I'm, I'm sorry this, uh, this has to end. Um, but um, thank you so much for joining us. It, it's been such a pleasure to, uh, to hear about your process. And um, I'm so looking forward to seeing this on the stage. Hopefully we can actually go to see things on the stage soon. Well, maybe not soon, but I hope, yes, I hope so. Maybe I want to thank, thank people for the, the chat. This, the, the, there were wonderful comments in the chat. Yes, yes. Right. I figured what, what you had to say, I think, resonates with all of us. So yeah. I hope you'll come so back to the Story Slam. Uh, no, we are going to be getting to the Story Slams shortly. So Right, but I'm telling all those people, come back to the Story oh, Slam. Oh, yeah, definitely. Everyone come to the Story Slam. Tell us your story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And uh, as we were just saying, we have a 15-minute break, and then we come back for our Story Slam. Please don't miss it.
We will never know how many friends and family didn't get COVID-19 because we followed safeguards. We'll never know that number. We'll never know how many lives we save because we wear masks, wash our hands, and keep our distance. We'll never know exactly who we help when we take protective steps each day. We'll only know that we did all we could to save people from a dangerous pandemic. And that's a nice thing for us to live with. Together, we are beating COVID-19. Whoopsie. Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll get that mute thing right one of these days. Welcome back. And I am very excited that we are about to present our first ever Telling Your Health Story, Story Slam. We've got uh, seven uh, folks who are uh, participating. And uh, Neil Bartom from First Person Arts is back to uh, introduce each of them and, and uh, ask them to tell us all a little bit about themselves and uh, tell us their stories. So we might go a little bit over the prescribed time. This is our final session of the day. So um, we uh, do promise to be respectful of your time. But um, anyway, if we go a little bit late, I hope you'll forgive us. It's because everyone is telling such great stories. Thank you. Hi, Charlotte. Hey, Neil. This is exciting. It sure is. It feels like this has been um, a, a year solid in the making, but maybe maybe it's been less than a year. It's hard to know anymore. <laughs> Well, I tell you, my my colleagues um, Angelica Irizarry and Renee Eiffel are such pros. I clearly I have trouble unmuting myself, so I you know I I don't know how they do it so well. It's it's wonderful. No, they've been they've been fantastic to work with on on my end. So I, I really appreciate the team that you've gathered over there. They are wonderful. So Neil, why don't you tell the uh, audience uh, how this is going to run and uh, bring in your first storyteller. Yeah, excellent. So each storyteller will have uh, about three to four minutes to tell their story. Um, hopefully they've done some preparation based on uh, yesterday's uh, session. Um, mm -hmm. When everybody comes on, I'm going to just chat with them for a minute or so before they start the story so that the audience can get to know them a little bit, you know, who's who's behind the story. Um, and um, they'll tell their story. I'll come back on and then we'll move on to the next storyteller. Um, some things that people might want to keep in mind are have a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, center yourself in the story uh, and uh, present some of the details along the way that uh, might not be obvious necessarily. So some of those um, senses, some of those feelings, um, give us the details. Uh, you can't tell everything, um, but give us give us the what you can. So this is this will be great. Yes. The only the thing I would point out, I've been to some um, story slams. Uh, there, there was obviously the one at Penn Nursing that you and I know about. Also, there was one at uh, Temple uh, Health that was wonderful. Um, and some of the story slams, uh, frankly, a couple of them I have, with the permission of the writer, of course, uh, picked up a transcript and just published them in the newspaper as columns. They, they are so uh, a well-constructed oral story makes a well-constructed written story. They're not as different as people might think. Very true, very true. So yeah, every everybody has compelling stories and we're gonna hear some great ones today, I'm sure. Great, Angelica, can you uh, bring in our storytellers? There you go. Yeah. And I think we're at seven of us, seven of them. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Excellent. Right, <laughs> um, let's see here. We have Helga going first. Helga, yeah. thanks so much for joining us, and thanks thanks for being willing to go number one slot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where in the world are you today? Well, I I'm outside of Philadelphia. Okay. All right. And um, when you're not uh, telling your health story or at Inquire conferences, uh, how do you fill your time? <laughs> Well, um, professionally, I am a software engineer. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, but I um, that's just my day job. I also moonlight as a fitness instructor, and I'm a figure skater, rock climber, cyclist. You got a, you got a lot going on. How do you have time to uh, collect stories? <laughs> I'm single with no children. 
Got it. Got it. Uh, have you have you performed stories or or something similar before? Not stories. Th then what? I'm also a tap dancer. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I wasn't expecting uh, tap dancing. Uh, in yeah. Today's, so I, I performed uh, in other mediums. <laughs> got it. Got it. Um, great. Any anything that you want folks to know before you launch into the story, or shall we just carry on? So I'm also a member of Inspire, which is the organization that's a sponsor of this conference that Charlotte mentioned in in the beginning. And so Thank I will you. be giving a patient perspective here. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And um, we will put about four minutes on the clock and the time is yours, Helga. Okay. So, when you under, undergo a medical procedure, you are given an informed consent which details the minute risks of your procedure. You probably glance over it and don't put much thought into the rare occurrences until you end up on the wrong side of the fence. That's when you learn that low risk does not equate to zero risk. My story starts when I was diagnosed with a polyp in my uterus. I was told by my doctor that I needed to have a DNC because the polyp may be cancerous. I seriously had my doubts. For starters, the polyp was diagnosed as a result of what was deemed as postmenopausal bleeding that just happened to occur a little past the magic 12-month time frame. I even had what my sister and I affectionately dubbed the PMZ the pre-menstrual zit. I was in a high school bathroom when I discovered this, no less. Fortunately, it wasn't my high school, otherwise my mental state would have taken a hit. <laughs> what I was most worried about was that the DNC was going to be performed under general anesthesia. And I had a perfect batting average when it came to delayed emergencies. I've had five surgeries. Each time during the pre-op consult, I would get ah, you're healthy, we'll go light. It won't be a problem. I even once had an anesthesiologist that claimed to be very talented in prompt emergencies. Humility obviously was not one of his strong suits. The results were all the same and not even the talented Mr. Anesthesiologist could achieve a prompt emergence on me. My surgeon dismissed my concerns with the standard, we'll go light. I reluctantly agreed to the procedure because of my own cancer history. I know the value of early diagnosis and the chance of a missed opportunity weighed heavily. DNC day came, the procedure itself went well. However, what happened next probably has effectively banned me from all future outpatient procedures. My heart rate dropped into the 20s, my blood pressure bottomed out, and after my vitals were brought back up, I had a seizure. Normally, the ICU would be the place to go, but it was full that day. By the way, this is pre-COVID. I was transferred to the ER. I finally started waking up hours after hours later while an EEG was being performed. The first thing that I noticed was that someone was messing with my head. And my immediate thought was, gosh, I hope they don't think that is my uterus. <laughs> I was about to tell them that girls don't think with their uteruses, but that's when I realized that I couldn't talk. Well, since I, I was intubated. Since I couldn't talk, that's time to resort to international sign language. But I couldn't do that either. I was, I was restrained. I seriously thought that I came out swinging and beat the living daylights out of someone. That's when it was finally explained to me that my issues with anesthesia had been taken to a whole new level. My first reaction was, Whew, thank God I didn't beat the crap out of anyone. But it did soon sink in that I came a bit close to joining Michael Jackson in the Death by Propofol Club. Hmm. You would think that after all this, plus the $90,000 price tag on a polyp that ended up at nine, that I would be furious. It was quite the opposite. Let's not forget I had a very contentious start with my surgeon. My level of respect for my surgeon and the team that cared for me completely went through the roof. My surgeon showed an immense amount of humility and empathy instead of defensiveness. He even came in on a Saturday to discharge me instead of leaving that formality to a res resident. By showing that there is very much a human with feelings beneath that mask and scrubs, he won my respect. After I got home, I wrote him a note, and it was not, see, I told you so. It said, although things didn't go smoothly, I'm very thankful for the care that I received. It was a stressful situation for everyone involved, 
but the compassion shown by you and your staff was immensely appreciated. I will try to use my one in a million charm on the Powerball next time instead of the anesthesia realm. Thanks so much, Helga. That was fantastic. There was a, a, a lot to take in there. Um, and I, I, I would love to hear more about this story <laughs> sometime if, you, uh, if you're willing yeah, thank to you. have the chance. So excellent. Hope to um, catch you again sometime and uh, also hear other stories from you at some point. I actually thought about writing about my, like the experience with my mother and like dealing with elderly. I'm glad I didn't because after hearing Lorraine, there's no way I would have been able to, to compete with that. <laughs> I can, I can sympathize, so. <laughs> All right, and Sujin is next on deck. Helga, we'll talk more later. Hello. Hi, Sujin, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good, so where in the world are you today? I'm in Chicago area. Okay, excellent, excellent. Are you, uh, are you based out of there normally? Yes. Excellent, yes. excellent. Um, and when you're not attending Inquirer conferences, how do you, how do you spend your days? So I'm a pharmacist. Um, and I'm also a patient advocate, um, and I do patient advocacy work in um, patient safety area and also um, work as a private patient safety, not, not patient safety, patient advocate hired by um, patients. Lovely. That sounds, sounds like super important work. Um, <laughs> and what else uh, do folks need to know about you before we get going. Is this a story of patient advocacy that we're going to hear? Well, so I call my, I have given me uh, myself a title call um, because I talk about empathy a lot. Um, and uh, I became, um, it became a title for me saying that I call myself as an empathy enthusiast. So it's going to be why I call myself that. Um, yeah, so that's going to be what the story is about. Wonderful, I, I love that phrasing, and uh, <laughs> I might I might find use for it uh, at other times in my life, other than <laughs> uh, what you're sharing today. So I hope that's all right, but I'll give you credit. So, uh, Sujin, you got about four minutes. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, so, why do I call myself an empathy enthusiast? Recently, I've been getting this question a lot, so I think it deserves an explanation. I think a lot of a healthcare, probably more than I should. The thought became me in a way that I just naturally think of healthcare all the time after my experience as a caregiver for my dad. Um, I have lost my dad due to many gaps of health care um, while um, he was staying in the United States as a foreigner. Although he had um, uh, ability to speak English, he had many cultural and language barriers in understanding his condition and taking care of um, his health. And, um, and I had the same issue as a caregiver. So he was so distressed with the care he was getting and um, he wanted to get a care um, in our home country, which is South Korea. And um, he had a, a very low sugar event um, twice in a row. And then um, a week before our flight, he passed away. So he couldn't get the care he wanted. And after that experience as a caregiver, uh, I became a pharmacist. And um, because um, how he died was part of, we thought part of, part of it was because of the um, insulin that he was on. Um, so I'm very passionate about patient safety and minority health, um, gaps of care, cost of care. Um, everything that has to do with patient care, I am very, very passionate. Um, and I'm even maybe obsessed about it too. Um, Cause I think about it, I think about it all the time. Uh, my friends and I wrote a business plan while I was uh, in high, um, pharmacy school for a care coordination app. 
I volunteered at health literacy groups and the local opioid initiative. I enrolled in a Master of Health Informatics program briefly, which I couldn't finish because of um, uh, personal issues. And now I'm at Northwestern University uh, studying health communication. Um, I'm also an ambassador for Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And I, uh, as I share, I work as a uh, professional patient advocate while working as a pharmacist in, in hospital. So people tell me I'm everywhere and doing too many things, um, but I have become an empath like many patient advocates I've gotten to know over the years. That much our healthcare system is fragmented and complex. After losing my dad, um, the stories of hurt patients are no longer just theirs. They are my story as well. I especially seek to be the voice for many patients who don't have voices at all for different reasons, like patients with language and cultural bar barriers. And realize, realization of this empathy became part of me, and it is my inclusive solution for all healthcare problems. Empathy is a connection and communication, and it happens when our feelings resonate from experience, expressions of one another. Patients seek health care to be understood, taken care, and feel better. Empathy from healthcare workers towards patients are only possible when there is enough room for patients in their hearts. Exhaustion and lack of support for healthcare workers are critical issues in healthcare that prevent this connection. When this connection is not established, how can patients get well? Health and care are not possible, and the efforts from patients and healthcare workers become a waste of time and resources, including money. The cost of healthcare needs to be contained while we seek to establish empathy at the same time. Healthcare cannot be improved if two are not done at the same time. Uh, I recently had to bring up an example of empathy in healthcare from my experience. When my dad was in the hospital getting a G2 place, he wanted a cup of tea as he was feeling cold. The diagnosis of stage three esophageal cancer was still fresh and he lost weight from inability to eat. I went to the nurse several times and even offered that I would get it myself, but there wasn't any way for me to do that. It took her 45 minutes to bring a, the cup of tea. I was hesitant to bring it up to the nurse, but I was um, mad and maybe sad that she did not understand the importance of the tea. I said, I've asked for the tea 45 minutes ago. This is the only thing he can take. And I could not finish my sentence as I started crying. I still remember the moment of empathy from her facial expression. I could see how sorry she felt. That moment was the moment of empathy for all of us who were present including my dad. Um, at the time, I did not even think of thinking further why it took her 45 minutes. As a healthcare professional now, I understand. She probably had too many patients to take care of and either might have forgotten in multitasking or did not think of it as a priority in her to-do list. However, the team meant a lot more to us. In a way, it was the hope for his life. Um, I'm actively seeking ways and knowledge in how to bring empathy to healthcare. One way, to, one way is to grow the awareness of patient safety and advocate for the full circle of empathy by taking care of healthcare workers is the start of the full circle of patient care. I also see using art as a tool to bring more awareness to the connection of empathy in healthcare. I'm open to conversations and collaborations don't hesitate to contact me if this resonates with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sujin. I, I really love that you have been able to shift your own perspective by being on kind of different sides of the um, experience. And that's, that's something that resonates with me as well as, you know, I've been a storyteller working in this world, but also a patient, you know, family of uh, patients. It's um, really, really powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, Thanks so much. There's a lot to, lot to chew on 
for me there. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, we'll see you in a little bit and we're bringing Jermaine up next. And... Hi. Hey, Jermaine, Hello. how are you? Good, thanks for having me. Wonderful, uh, and where in the world are you? I'm in Wildwood Crest, New Jersey. Nice, I've been there before. At the beach. Lovely, mm -hmm. lovely. Um, and uh, are you in Wildwood Crest full-time in life, or is that a? I am now, our business closed due to COVID. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, and um, what should folks know about you before you dive into your story mm -hmm. today? Um, well, this story is inspired a bit by yesterday's lecture or speak with um, Elvis from Prevention Point mm -hmm. and the um, the piece they were reading from The Things They Carry. Yes. And then I also kind of blended in a bit about um, what changed. So okay. my son is a heroin addict and um, Prevention Point has been invaluable to us as a family and to him. So I'll go ahead and read my piece. I called it my beloved addict and me. The phone call changed everything. My 16 year old son called to tell me that he was a drug addict. What kind of drugs I asked? Heroin, he said. On the way home, I pulled over to wail and scream because you see my brother Dan had been a schizophrenic drug addict who died in a mental hospital at 45. My main goal as a parent had been to ensure that this did not happen to my children. My parents had nine kids. My mother was an alcoholic. I had two and there was no liquor in my home, no smoking, no drugs. I made homemade chocolate chip cookies and treasure hunts. I allowed them to build forts on the deck and sleep under the stars, but it wasn't enough. The bubble burst with that phone call. The closest detox that would accept a minor was four hours away in Altoona, PA. The night before, I packed his suitcase with the things he'd need. Pajama pants, t-shirts, clean socks, toiletries, notebooks and pens, almost as if he was going away to camp. If we can catch it early, I thought. Into the waiting room shuffled a thin man with a quick smile and a handshake for all the young bloods. In his other hand, he carried his essentials in a ragged green trash bag. And I remember thinking that will never be my son. 11 years, a dozen rehabs, countless hospital visits, multiple court dates and a few jail terms later. And what I know now is that I am one of the lucky ones because my son is still alive, I think. And if he could just get himself to rehab by his own will, I wouldn't give a rat's ass how he carried in the things he'd need. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. I really appreciate that perspective of um, uh, a parent of somebody struggling and um, some beautiful details that you provided in there. So thank you. Th thanks again for um, also acknowledging that, you know, what, what this conference has brought to you. So I hope to see more from you at some point. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. We're bringing up Donna next to the virtual stage. Donna, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm I'm great. Um, where where in the world are you today? I am in South Jersey, just across the bridge from Philadelphia. Love it, love it. And um, how do you you spend your days when you're not uh, at virtual conferences? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, right now I am a consultant working for a nonprofit uh, organization in Camden, New Jersey. Um, most of the time I am um, consulting in IT or customer success with software. I've worked for healthcare organizations, um, Penn Medicine, um, Bainline Health. So I've got a little bit of a background with uh, healthcare, at least from the technical side. Love it. Love it. And uh, what should folks know about your, your story today before you get going? Well, unfortunately, I picked caregiver, so it's not going to be quite as dramatic of a reading, but um, it's um, how I became a caregiver for my father. Looking forward to it. All right, Donna, take it away. Okay, thank you. It was supposed to be a normal school day for an average 11-year-old kid, but it wasn't. I woke with a sense that something was different about this supposed normal school day. 
I don't know me what made me sense the strangeness of the day. It didn't smell any different. It was bright and it was a sunny spring day, but there were hushed tones, low conversations. You know, the type of someone is talking, but you don't know who it is or what they're saying. The vibrations in my home that morning were off and me as a little kid felt it. Something was wrong. Something bad had happened. My mother instructed me to dress myself for school and get ready to go to a neighbor's house for breakfast. They would be leaving as soon as my Uncle Bob arrived. My father was sick. He needed to go to the hospital. Yep, this was not going to be a normal day. When my uncle arrived, I knew it was bad. He had a sense of deep concern, a dread on his face, the likes of which I'd never seen on anyone's face before. Yep, something bad had happened, I said to myself. I remember watching my uncle run up the stairs to my parents' bedroom, and when he emerged, my dad's youngest brother carried my father in his arms like one would carry a baby. I watched through the screen door as my uncle gently carried my father to his car so that they could go to the hospital. I stood there alone, not really scared, more like I was having an out-of-body type of experience. Watching this strange scene unfold before my eyes, I knew that life as I know it for the brief 11 years would never be the same again. I knew it was going to be significant, but little did I know that that day would mark the end of my childhood. I had no way of understanding how my childhood would change. I couldn't comprehend at the age of 11 that in the very near future, when my father came home, I would morph from being an 11 year old kid to becoming a caregiver for my dad. My hero, my father, my protector, my buddy had suffered the first of many massive strokes that would plague him for 18 more years. On that day, in the new title that was dumped on me out of necessity would forever foreshadow my life going forward. For my dad was just the first of quite a few beloved family members that I would assume the role of primary caregiver for them as well. In the early days during the day, my mother attended community college and she would work it late at night. Me, I would go to school in the morning and come home in the afternoon to attend to my dad's needs. I remember particularly that our living room had to be transformed. It contained a large omnipresent hospital bed, a very awkward wheelchair, a wooden cane that to this day stands in the corner of my bedroom and a very ugly, ugly commode, along with other very strange medical supplies. These are the items that I think, back, think about when I think back to my childhood. I hated them. I hated my role. I didn't take to the role graciously. No, dare I say, I didn't take to it at all. I was bitter. I was mad. I didn't want this situation. I didn't want this role. I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be different from other kids. I wanted my family's life to be like that of my friends' families. I wanted to stay and hang out with my friends after school, but I couldn't. Instead, I had to go home to care for my father. I wanted my old dad back. The one I got was broken. This one couldn't walk, couldn't feed himself, and could barely talk with me. It was up to me to assist him with all of his basic life's tasks and needs. I resented my role. I resented my responsibilities. I resented his illness, and I actually hated my life. My interactions with my dad were not always kind and gentle as they should have been, but I was a kid. My mind was underdeveloped. I was immature. I wasn't ready for the caregiver role. I just simply wasn't fit. I loved my dad, but the one who came home from the hospital was damaged goods, and that was incomprehensible to an 11-year-old child. I wanted to turn back the hands of time and start all over but that was never going to happen. People ask me, how was your childhood? Was it good or was it bad? My answer is neither. I didn't have a childhood. Throughout my teens, my dad and I had what one could be consider a cantankerous relationship. I guess it's best described as a push me, pull me type of love affair. And it went both ways. Some days I loved him, some days I didn't. And it was the same for him. I became a reluctant caregiver, just going through the motions. I was just a kid after all with a tremendous amount of responsibility. Over time, with lots of therapy, my dad became more independent and self-sufficient, but I still had to be there to take care of him, although he didn't rely on me quite so much. 
Yeah, while he improved, I wasn't. There was no therapy or treatment for me. I just had to go on pretending to be an adult. I wanted to be a kid, but life had other plans. I stayed bitter and angry. I was a ch teenager struggling like normal teenagers, yet I was different. I had other things that I was struggling with as well. It took me many years and many trips to the ER with my dad and almost losing him that made me let go of the anger and resentment. With maturity, I came to understand that this man, this broken, damaged goods dad, had, done not, had not done this to himself. He didn't plan to ruin my childhood. He was just sick. He was just my dad. Eventually, I came to terms with the significance of my role as his caregiver. It was indeed a privilege a privilege to care for him. I became the person that my dad relied upon. He trusted me implicitly over anyone else. And in spite of all the challenges that he and I faced during those early years, we became a team and he knew I would never let anything or anyone hurt him. To illustrate that, if it was snow and ice on the ground and my dad had to go out to a doctor's appointment, he would freeze from fear of falling. There was no one who could make him move besides me. I would extend my hand and gently whisper, I got you, Pop. I won't let anything happen to you. I won't let you fall. I guess I grew into my caregiver role after all, and it turns out I was pretty darn good at it. Um, <clears throat> in the end of his life, I was the only person that my Pop communicated with. I had the honor of being the last person to speak with him. As he lay on his hospital bed, he told me that he was tired and he couldn't go on anymore. I whispered gently and quietly in his ear that it was okay if he needed to let go, that we would be okay. And in the end, when he passed, I remember thinking, life as I know it will never be the same again. I loved my dad. Wow, thanks so much, Donna. Um, something I heard in there that I, I is, is really gonna stick with me is, um, you saw that physical transformation of, uh, I believe you said, you said it was your living room and recognizing how that paired with yeah. the transformation of your your own role, your relationship with your father, just your family, and kind of intangible aspects shifting as well. So thanks again for, thanks. for sharing Thank you. that. Yeah, we'll talk more soon. Um, Tiffany, you're up next. Hey. Hi, Tiffany, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, where in the world are you today? I am right here in Philly. Nice, excellent. Um, and um, how do you spend your time when you're not at Inquire conferences? Well, I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the Drexel University uh, College of Nursing and Health Professions, and I'm also a labor and delivery nurse. You've you've got a full full calendar or schedule, I suppose. Then. I do. <laughs> excellent. Well, I'm grateful for um, you spending some time with us today. Sure. Uh, any anything that people should know before you? Get going? Um, no, just that I love my job. I love being a nurse. And um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. All right, take it away, Tiffany. Thanks. I was as nervous as could be when I walked in. There were people in every crack and crevice of the room. 150 of us crammed into a moderate sized classroom. Actually, it was two classrooms separated by a wall divider. I looked around. There is one, there is another one. I attempted to count everyone I could find. I missed a few that day, but it wouldn't be long, it wouldn't take long to realize that there were only seven black students in the spring 2005 nursing class. Two guys and five girls, seven out of 150. Hmm, that's almost 5%. It wasn't much, but it was better than the 3% of us represented throughout the university. How were they defining diversity anyway? It never made sense to me. We were touted as the most diverse large university in the country. In fact, we'd won several awards for this diversity. But as I looked around the classroom, there was very little diversity in sight. It was bad enough that there was no nursing, there was there were no nursing students who looked like me. But there were also no nursing faculty who looked like me. Of the 30 or so full-time tenure track undergraduate nursing faculty at my university, none were black. There were two black professors who taught at the graduate level, but I never interacted with them. The lack of representation at school at a school awarded for diversity was startling. There was no one for us to turn to when we had issues. For instance, during our first clinical rotation, my black classmate and new friend 
was told by a patient that she was okay being cared for by my classmate because she let a nigger boy cut her lawn. My classmate was devastated. I was devastated for her, but we had no one to turn to. During our first year of our three-year nursing program, we lost two of the seven black nursing students who began in the program. One girl left after only a week. She had just delivered a baby days before starting nursing school, so it wasn't a surprise. Another girl failed our second semester pathophysiology class. I was heartbroken. We were study buddies. What was I going to do now? I felt all alone. I decided to become a nurse educator because I wanted to help diversify nursing faculty. I wanted black students to see themselves in me. Unfortunately, my story is not unique. There are nearly 4 million registered nurses in the United States. 45% of us are people of color and 10% of us identify as black or African American, which is not far off from the 12% of black Americans among the US population. But when we look at the number of black nursing faculty, the racial disparity grows. One in five schools of nursing faculty are people of color. One in 10 are black. Data from the National League for Nursing shows that black nursing faculty enter academia at a higher rate than white nursing faculty, but are promoted to associate level and administrative positions at a lower rate. Right here in our own backyard is the greatest racial disparity. Upwards of 40% of Philadelphians identify as black, yet only 19 of the 308 nursing faculty at the five Philadelphia universities offering bachelor's programs in nursing are black. That's 6%, 6% in a city of 40%. Make it make sense. Of the 19 black faculty in the Philadelphia universities, six are tenured, three full professors, three associate professors, and one black man. That's right, one black male nursing faculty member out of 308 in a city of more than 57,000 black men and boys. One, make it make sense. Representation matters. So by failing to have a citywide nursing faculty that's representative of our residents, we are failing Philadelphians, black Philadelphians. We know that patients of color often prefer healthcare professionals with the same self-identified race and ethnicity. We know that these patients do better under their care. We know that nurse practitioners have the same or better patient satisfaction scores and patient health outcomes as physicians. So where are the black nurses? 6% in a city of 40%. In the wake of a summer highlighting racial injustice, I'm calling on Philadelphia schools of nursing to lead the charge for increased diversity among nursing faculty and students. We are the birthplace of our country, the home of world renowned universities and hospitals, and the city that helped place the first black, Southeast Asian and female vice president in the White House. Yet diversity among nursing faculty in diversity among that nursing faculty, we have to do better. Our city leads in so many ways. Let's make sure we're on the right side of nursing history. Thank you. Amazing, thanks so much, Tiffany. These, these numbers are stark and you have done your research. I, I gotta sit down with you at some point and figure out how you found sure. all that, but kudos to you, thank you. Um, hopefully some of the audience members have been inspired as well to take a closer look at this. All right, and we have Randy coming up next to the stage. Hi there, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, uh, and where where are you today? I am in um, Scottsdale, Arizona. Oh, all right. Um, and um, when you're not telling your health story here, uh, how do you spend your time? I am a dermatologist um, okay. working in a private clinic in Scottsdale. Love it, love it. And do you have a Philly or Inquirer connection or you're just inspired? My husband's whole family is in Philadelphia and my children are only allowed to be Eagles and, and uh, Sixers fans. And <laughs> their rooms are plastered with um, paraphernalia from those teams. So love it. we have a love good it. connection. Excellent. And uh, is there anything folks should know about uh, you or, or the context for this story before you get going? Um, I guess it's worth knowing, hopefully I'll tell, that um, I'm a physician and usually I spend my time thinking about the care and stories of my own patients. Um, but in this case, um, I became a patient and mm. it was a very emotional time in my life. And so I um, started to write about that. Um, I was an English major before I became a doctor 
And so I used to always do a lot of reading and writing. And um, I decided at some point that poetry to me was a kind of word calculus mm -hmm. and that there was a way to solve my problems through writing. Super, looking forward to this. All right, Randy, take it away. I was a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a physician. Then one day after the birth of my second child, I discovered that I had a skin cancer called melanoma. My older son had spilled apple juice all over the floor. And as I was cleaning it up, I noticed a black spot on the bottom of my foot. My challenge was to continue to be competent at all my previous roles while adding my new role as a patient. This involved undergoing surgery, pumping for the baby and pre-op, recovering, elevating my foot I couldn't walk or carry, working my clinic with stitches in my foot, rearranging habits of my outdoor lifestyle, and the ongoing fear of recurrence and leaving my children without a mother. I wrote goodbye letters to my two-year-old and newborn. I bought sun protective clothing for everyone. They called us the blue team because in those days, swim shirts only came in blue. I credited my son for saving my life. My family wondered what they would do if my kids died, if, with my kids if I died. I began to write poems about my worries and my imaginary relationship with my melanoma. Now, 15 years later, I am grateful to be alive. I find writing to be my salvation. I savor every moment with my pale, very, very pale, sunscreened, indoor basketball playing teenage boys. I'll read two short poems I wrote during that time to move myself past my fear back into living my life. Naming. The witch whispered, melanoma would be a royal name. And she pricked a mother's finger with a thorn and the blood fell and stained the pregnant skin black as a diamond. The witch blinked. Melanoma is a starry name, but heavenly babies cried. So the witch shrieked her sharp song until it silenced all the light of the sun. The lonely witch whimpered, melanoma is my name, hoping she could harness the howling and carry the mother with her on her painted broom up and away. But she didn't know who she was dealing with because the first child's name was life and the second child's name was laughter and their mother's name was hold on tight. The witch hissed, melanoma is a sticky name but the mother smiled and pulled off the Band-Aid and the witch popped like a child's balloon left behind on the grass. The next poem is called Shook. Shook the box, mixed up the colors, lopsided rainbow, asymmetric smile. Ripped off the labels, done this before and all the colors survived and went on to succeed. So just endure the melting, unwrapping, Crayola cracking chaos and get ready to paint. That's all. Wow. Thanks so much for, for sharing that, Randy. Um, I, a lot of really great imagery in there as, uh, as I know that you know already. Um, and I'm um, glad that you're here to share all that with us. Thank you. So thank you. Excellent. Our final storyteller of today's session is Bonnie. Um, Bonnie? Hi. Hi, how are you? Excellent, thank you. Um, and where in the world are you? I'm in Havertown, which is often called Have No Town, accurately. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, and uh, how, do you, how do you spend your days? I'm a grief coach, an author, and an artist, and I'd say the pursuer of anything else that sort of crosses my mind that I feel like I need to check out. I, I understand that very well, believe oh, it or not. So. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Excellent. And um, what do folks need to know uh, about you and anything kind of contextual for your story that you're sharing today? Hmm. Uh, I would have to say that it's actually kind of R-rated. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Good to know. All right, uh, folks, if you are listening with um, some sensitive ears, um, you've you've received your uh, your rating warning. So um, I believe we're good to go. And Bonnie? Yep. Okay. The woman I hired to sit with my husband so I could get a full night's sleep for the first time in weeks knocked on the bathroom door. It was close to 9 a.m. and I was groggy and disoriented, but conscious enough to sense how safe and womb-like it felt to be in the stall 
under warm water. She banged a second time. Teens are changing, she yelled. I had a mop of thick hair, uncut, the entire 13 months since my husband's diagnosis. The shampoo to lather it up was in my palm. My palm was perched over my head. It was almost the last of the shampoo I had been rationing, unable to break away from caregiving to get to the store. Shampoo that would take three to four minutes to rinse out. Should I or shouldn't I? That's what went through my head in the midst of the urgent banging. It's going on four years now, and I have no recall of this woman's name, nor can I picture her face, but I can hear her voice echoing in my ears as if she just shouted those words yesterday. She knocked again. Teens are changing. I shut off the water, wiped the shampoo on a towel, grabbed my bathrobe, ran, dripping, leaving a trail, slipping, sliding over the hardwood floors into the dining room where my husband's hospital bed was. The woman was standing on the far side of the bed, eyes like a ping pong ball, bouncing between my nakedness and my husband's wrist held in her hand. I stood, frozen, a few feet from the bed. My husband's eyes were wide open. He was staring right at me, right at my breasts with his blue grays. A bit glassy, but open for the first time in days. I replay our usual morning routine in my head. I'm running late, tiptoeing into the bedroom for my morning shower, from my morning shower, trying not to awaken him, but he would always roll over, open his eyes, smile a wide grin and chant. What do you say to a naked lady? Nice tits. I'd fake blush and swat him away as if I were a Southern belle and he an unsuitable suitor. At the start of our relationship, the feminist in me hated the word tits. But as the years went on, it became our ritual, our normal. And damn it, I had no idea just how much I had been missing it. It was wonderful to play it out just once more. A loud, raspy noise pulled me back to reality. It was unmistakably the sound I had read about in the hospice book. I understood. My husband was actively dying. I closed the bathrobe, took his hand, and rambled as I always do when I'm nervous. I accompanied him as he transitioned from this world to the next by telling him how it made sense he was going first. He was the one who would jump into the deep end while I was busy dipping my toe in the shallow waters, how he should check it out to show me later. I had no idea these were my thoughts about the afterlife, but out they came for 15 minutes, sentence after sentence, about love, about light, and about how much I would miss him. I barely took a breath, yet the time between his breaths became longer and longer until there was only silence. He looked so beautiful and peaceful, white wispy hair from his treatments curling about his face, an image that has permanently implanted itself behind my eyelids and in my heart. There was an unfamiliar but comforting quiet without the whir of the oxygen machine, without the worry of what his next normal might be, without the looping voices in my head about not being brave enough or not strong enough to watch my husband die. All I wanted now was to be alone. But death in America is not a quiet or solitary activity. There were hospice nurses arriving, papers to fill out, my husband's sister on the way, the coroner, the surprise of being asked to pick out clothing for my husband's cremation, and the phone calls to family and friends. It was well into the afternoon when the hubbub wore down and my sister-in-law and I were the only ones left in the house. I looked down to discover I was still in my bathrobe. This prompted me to tell her the same story I just shared with you. At the end, I said, I think it's time I get dressed. I opened my bathrobe and she smiled, a smile so reminiscent of my husband's, and declared, my brother was right. You really do have nice tits. We laughed until we cried in each other's arms. 
the healthy way to grieve. And one of the dozens of firsts I would experience that were not mentioned in that hospice book. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Bonnie, for um, closing us out today with that. Seems uh, more, more fitting, I think, uh, than I could have predicted. So who knew? Thanks so much. Thank for, you for the for opportunity. Sharing. Yeah, no, yeah. this was this was lovely. Um, and Charlotte's going to come back on and we'll have a few minutes together. Yes. Wow. I, you know, it's funny, Neil, I, you do this all the time, but, um, you know, as a newspaper editor, I'm, I'm, I can go with the flow, but I usually know what I'm about to uh, hit publish on. And I, so this was, this was a risk, but wow, our storytellers were all amazing. Yeah. People, people really brought it today. And, um, you know, as Sujin noted, you know, you carry other stories with you and and now I'm going to carry these stories myself. And I, I imagine our audience and storytellers will as well. So Neil, um, this is, has me thinking that probably a lot of people would like to know uh, what other opportunities there are to participate in story slams. And I know that first person arts is doing online story slams. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, we're doing virtual story slams about uh, once a month. Mm -hmm. And um, folks can check out our website, sign up for our mailing list. We're on all the social media, of course. And the way that we're running those now is if somebody's interested in, in telling a story uh, because they're not you know, about to enter a room, uh, you have to sign up beforehand uh, a couple days mm -hmm. in advance and get your name in um, in the virtual bucket. Uh, and then we have five storytellers uh, an evening. And we release the theme of the next slam uh, a few weeks or a few months before um, a given one. And uh, our Grand Slam is coming up uh, a week from tonight. Uh, oh. So we've already got the people for that from the winners of the previous story slams of this season. Uh, and then December will be our next kind of regular virtual story slam. But we can all watch if we want to. We're, oh yes, everybody tickets. everybody can, can tune in and watch. Yeah. Do, uh, do you buy tickets or is it just? You can buy tickets at firstpersonarts.org. Yep. Super. Okay, yep. great. Well, thank you so much, Neil. This was really a treat. We're going to have to do this again sometime. It was an honor and a pleasure. Thanks so much for, for bringing me in, Charlotte. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that wraps us up. Um, I wanted to thank every one of you here for spending your time with us here at Telling Your Health Story. Um, it has been a very, well, this year has been different from last year in about ways that I, I lost track of long ago, but this is a case where different is um, sometimes wonderful. So I um, hope that this event inspires all of you to continue writing and, and thinking about new ways to contribute your experience and your expertise. Um, uh, I, like I said, um, we're always looking for great stories at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and you'll be getting information about how to submit stories in your email soon. Um, I also want to mention what sounds like a really exciting opportunity um, for health writers. Um, Dr. Naomi Rosenberg at uh, Temple, who opened up our conference yesterday with that um, great writing exercise, um, she is putting together a new certificate in narrative medicine program at Temple University. And she's doing this with my friend, Mike Vitez, who um, is a uh, former Inquirer staff writer. He won a Pulitzer Prize here uh, some years ago for his health writing. He now works at Temple. And he was telling me last night that he thinks really anyone who comes to this conference uh, might really uh, be eligible for and really enjoy this um, narrative medicine certificate program Naomi is putting together. So if you're interested in that, let us know and we'll get you connected with Naomi. Uh, once more, many, many, many thanks to our presenting sponsor, Independence Blue Cross, and our co-sponsor, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, for making this program possible and also for supporting health journalism at the Philadelphia Inquirer at a time when it's more important than it's ever been before. Uh, thanks also to inspire.com. It was so great to get to uh, actually see some of um, the inspire.com storytellers. And as always, a big shout out to the leadership at the Philadelphia Inquirer and also the Lenfest Institute for Journalism. 
Telling your health story is a conversation that goes on every day, everywhere, but especially at the Inquirer. I hope that we hear much more from all of you. And for so many reasons, I so hope that the next time we all gather for our conference, we can do it together physically again. So thank you all so much for your attention and enjoy the rest of your day and keep writing. <laughs>